<laughs> Thank you. Eating. Eating. Welcome everyone to the official I thought I was discussion. Yeah, and Alan was was actually not going to be here, but he rescheduled his life so he could be uh, and join us, which is pretty excellent of him. So I appreciate that. Um, and as you can see, AP is already in the chat. I said it's late, pay, it's past my bedtime, but I'm here because these discussions are always worth it. I may have to tap out at some point. I appreciate you, AP. Uh, those time zones are a killer. Um, but yeah, we're going to be discussing the Bone Hunters with full spoilers. So if you haven't read the Bone Hunters and you care, um, you know, it might not be uh, something that you want to check out. Um, that was our SMS says too late. <laughs> I changed the thumbnail. I'm in the thumbnail now. That's yeah, it. I changed the thumbnail. I updated everything. You're tagged okay, in the video. Me. Wow. Um, but uh, I should probably introduce my guests, though. I think everyone's pretty um, uh, well versed in them now because they're always on the channel, it seems. Uh, but Philip, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing well, Jimmy. It, it is such a pleasure to be here. I was anticipating a wonderful discussion with you and Joanna. And lo and behold, there's Alan, too. Wow. So I, oh. I'm super excited. Super I thought excited. that was going somewhere different. It's like I was oh. anticipating a wonderful discussion, and then Alan's here. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I got excited when I saw you. So, yeah. <laughs> and Joanna, well, how are you? matching colors. I oh, think. yeah, you guys are matching. That is true. So yeah. true. And then me yes, and Joanna have you. glasses. Hi. <laughs> yes, I'm so excited to be here. And I'm so excited you're here too, Alan. I got excited about that. I was telling Jimmy that you would be screaming Egaton from the comment section yeah, if you weren't here. Much. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, think thank Al you so much. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Always love having you on, Joanna. Um, Alan actually told me, so if you have me on for any discussion, it has to be the Bone Hunters. I, I, like, I believe, it's believe my, that was the It's exact. my favorite. It's my favorite of the of the 10. Um, Yigatan alone uh, sells the book, Price of Admission. You could, like, I don't know. Yigatan is, is so good. I love, I love Yigatan so much, so much. I look forward to reading it every time I go back to the book. Yeah, I believe uh, it's chapter seven, right? Because yeah. I, I tweeted, I said chapter seven's better than most books I've read. It's 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 absolutely fantastic. It is a master class in um, claustrophobia, um, military action, uh, siegecraft rather, and like you know, the the whole characters developing through uh, yeah. being in intense, life threatening situations together. Uh, yeah. just like, you know, uh, traumatic uh, bonding. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. Traumatic yeah. bonding. It's, it's so freaking good. Like I read it, I read that it was <clears throat> not last Christmas of 19 question mark Christmas of, I don't know. It was, yeah. Christmas of 19 is when I read that scene last and I, um, I read it all in one sitting. Like everybody's having, you know, they're hanging out, the family's hanging out and I'm at the table just like, Oh, chapter seven. <laughs> just reading. <laughs> I think I broke mine up into two uh, two um, sessions because nice. it was so long. But I think it was the last thing I did on that day, and then the first thing I did the next day. <laughs> is it is it night in Japan right now? Kombanwa? Is it is it or is it morning? Uh, Could be morning. I'm gonna go with morning. Ohio. I'm just gonna guess. I have no Ohio. Ohio is. Um, yeah. Paul wants to know what Philip will be singing tonight. Paul, um, it's um, it's karaoke night, so we're all gonna sing something. Oh, are we? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, News I, to I, me. I didn't warm up my false folds in my neck. This is, this is <laughs> going to be trouble. Uh, I always like starting out these streams, uh, as most of you know, with a little bit of trivia. The only piece of trivia I have now, actually, I think comes from my episode of Chatting with Nuts with Steven Erickson, uh, where I was asking him about books that were challenging to write and like what was the hardest time to write in his life. And he mentioned, um, I believe it was The Bone Hunters. Uh, and saying how difficult this book was to write because of the structure, because it's really two books, like it's basically two, two novels. So how do you structure that and put those together and make it not feel so much like two separate novels, uh, which I think is certainly true about this book, that it feels like two books. But naturally, it, it kind of goes it fits as one tale of Malazan. Uh, so I think he did an excellent job in that. And I think we should all show off our covers because we all four. <sighs> Have different editions, which I have to say, Alan's is the worst. <laughs> it, I mean, how, why is it the worst? Can you quantify that? I Other mean, it's just it's just a dude with some edgy lighting. I, I I don't. You have a you have a freaking carriage that is losing its luggage. What does that have to do with anything about? The <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Yours, uh, is the, yours is the bottom. See, uh, Phillip, I think mine wins. I think I, I, I think really Joanna's wins. Joanna's has Phillips is better than mine. Far. Mine, mine doesn't have the uh, range that Phillips does because he has Ganos on a horse, which is dope. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, that's, you have Kal- you have Kalam. So that's I mean, the old Kalam. mass part paperback, right, Philip? The old mass market paperback. I believe so. Yeah. I mean, this is very Christmassy, though, is it not? Like it, this it is. Does look, it literally looks like it could be the, the season to take a cart and murder people. I guess. It does. It almost Santa. like reminds me of look, Santa's, you know, sleigh or something. Yeah. <laughs> Mine has generic assassin on the front. Like, what says edgy and dark better than? Yeah, generic boy. assassin in blue lighting <laughs> <laughs> i mean i mean if you're into Thank that you. Alan, i guess I, I just I, like the paperback I, I i read paperback the mass market paperback so much faster <laughs> even though it's heavy and i drop it on my face all the time well paul says it's the crappy cover that joanna has which what? makes me laugh because i think hers is better than ours so i'm not gonna have yeah. this slander of the carriage accident all right it's, ter- it's terrible it's the best thing that happens in this book no, that's okay. Not it's the most time. iconic thing. It's that's not. It's not iconic. <laughs> like I definitely yeah. think of the Kara Jackson when I think of. <laughs> the Words have to mean something, Jimmy. You can't just say iconic. You can't just throw that out there. <laughs> I challenge you to turn on any local news station and see that that is not true. That words do not matter. I mean, ooh. okay. <laughs> Sorry, words should matter. Should matter. Sorry, yes. And we're trying right. to change they that don't. here. You're absolutely the, correct. They do not matter. Yes, the fancy network is where that movement begins. Never. <laughs> oh, all right. So let's talk about the prologue because I thought this prologue was extraordinarily creepy. I thought it was very atmospheric mm-hmm. and I really, really enjoyed it. I did read Night of Knives before this, which also had an immense amount of atmosphere to it. And I thought that oh, yeah. that was the strongest aspect of that book. And I think it's, it's... A spider prologue. Yeah, it's a spider oh, prologue. Yeah. yeah. So we're introduced to Cartel City that is riddled with spiders and creepy things and all of the sorts. Right. We're also introduced to a very drunk soldier named Hellion, yes. uh, who Yay. I happen to like quite a bit. I love Hellion. Yes. Who, oh, She's awesome. Happens to be a terrified of spiders, but won't leave the island. <laughs> I love Hellion. Um, yes. And then also uh, Derek, I guess I'm going to say it's, it's probably Derek. I think it's Drek. Drek. All right, right. So Drek, the Worm of Autumn, is also brought up in a temple full of dead people is happening. And there's someone named Banishar or Banishar. And it, uh, Dejim is on the loose thanks to the Nameless Ones. And we yeah. also meet Barathal Mekar, cousin to Kalam. That's a lot. That's a lot. That a lot. That's a lot. It's a prologue. Yeah. I love yeah. It's a, it's a Malazan prologue. That's for damn sure. Um, what, what do you guys think of Cartel City, though? I mean, I just thought it was awesome. I thought that was a, that, that was an awesome prologue. Like I had when I made it back to Bone Hunters, I had forgotten. I I remember we're talking spoilers, right? Like, yeah, yeah. This is <laughs> full okay, spoiler. Go for I, it. Re- I remembered Yigatan, of course, and I remembered the plague, and that's but mostly it of what I remembered except the spider prologue like i remembered the freaking it, the atmosphere in cartoon city is is oh, it's terrifying it's terrifying and then you know banisher finding the you know, stupid banisher um but you know it's super creepy i lo- i loved it and i love hellion hellion is hellion is mvp of, yes. of reaper scale she's a good time what a great introduction to that character too yeah, absolutely yeah. Yes. i love her in the next book yeah by the way jimmy if you like cartoon um Esselmon's Path to Ascendancy is. Uh, is it really? You get yes. more of Cartool in in Path to Ascendancy. We don't ever I, go back in the main books. I don't think. I don't think so. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's a shame. And I, I will say this: I actually really wanted more central things to happen at the island. So I'm glad to hear that because yeah. for the setting and everything, I didn't feel like I got enough out of it when I was done with the book. I was like, ah, kind of wish we went back to Cartool a little bit. You know, I, I wish that that would have been a more central focus to the whole book. So hearing that's awesome. And actually, Path to the Ascendancy seems to continually be the one I hear about the yeah. most that I'm most excited, excited to, to get. It. It makes yeah. I think you'll love it. I think you'll love it. Yeah. It theoretically is going to make me not hate Tatrin, So Yeah. 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 Bet. There's a big bet riding on that. Yeah. So. I have a big, fat $10 bet. <laughs> yeah, man. That's a lot of Kindle <laughs> deals. Um, uh, yeah. I really things- feel like I need footnotes in my Malazan books to tell me what other books in the Malazan series that... <laughs> Ripper, you know, where I can find out more about what that makes yeah, sense. Compendium. So, reference, yeah, compendium. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Reference notes. Uh, maybe AP and Philip can put that out. That'd yes. be sweet. Yeah. <laughs> if there's anyone that could do it, it'd be those. Yeah, because we're both super organized guys, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well if you, you could go on sabbatical and that could be your like academic <laughs> project. <laughs> uh, one of the cool things about this prologue and Cartool City is we all know that the Malazans love. 
uh, invading. <laughs> they love invading and taking over and imposing their culture and their rule an on other places. And and generally, that's a bad thing. They're an empire, right? Like we we generally can root against that because you lose culture when that happens and people you know are robbed of their homes. You gotta 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 right. However, Cartel City and uh, Drek the Worm of Autumn is kind of bad. I mean, they stone dogs to death during the beginning of the clear season. Rude. They flail criminals and throw people into pits with fireworms, which that's like my worst nightmare. And the molasses took over. Now there's kennels. They're not dragging people through the street and flaying them. There's more gods to worship. So there's a little bit more, you know, diversity when it comes to that. And there's no slavery anymore. Mm -hmm. So was it good? Yeah, I feel like the series does that, doesn't it? It kind mm -hmm. of shows colonial, I mean, yeah, colonization in sort of different ways, the good and the bad, and not just all bad or not just all good. So it's in, complicated. <laughs> in fantasy books, like in fiction, I often find myself rooting for uh, empire. Um, I don't know if it's just because I teach Latin and I'm a big fan of the Romans, and it have to be the dynasty. Yes, I mean, that's exactly why, Alan. Yeah, I mean, it probably it probably is. I'm just, <laughs> yes, you know, how, how Roman of you. Uh, so, you know, I, I like the Malazans. But that's a historical debate, too, about, mm -hmm. you know, the Roman Empire as well, isn't it, Alan? Because you could argue that, yes, the Romans were evil and, and, and you know, conniving and, and um, constantly warring with their weaker neighbors because they're so acquisitive and all that. But there are people who would argue that they brought, uh, you know, an end to certain barbaric practices or that they, they improve lives where they went and, and so on. And so it's you sad. see the same thing with the Malazans uh, constantly in the yeah. series. We, yeah. we yeah. even see that a little bit. Don't we even see that a little bit in the House of Chains with Karsa when he becomes oh my like, goodness. taken as a prisoner? Yeah. And mm -hmm. the way he's treated, he's treated much better than he would have otherwise. Yeah. It, it's like that uh, Life of Brian sketch. Well, what have the Romans ever done for us? But, you know, they give him health care or like improved medicine, roads, education system, system of laws. And like, yeah, but besides the roads and medicine and system of <laughs> laws and aqueducts, what have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> Everyone in the comments was already <laughs> saying it. That's so funny. Yeah. Exactly. What have the, the Malazans aqueduct? ever done for us? <laughs> <The aqueduct? laughs> so, yeah, uh, we I talk about that in my classes, uh, Philip, because Caesar, I talk about Caesar. Uh, yeah. My entire Latin two class is I do Caesar's on Caesar on Wednesdays, his autobiography. And the big thing is, was Caesar uh, like, was Caesar a mass murderer? Yes. Yes. He killed a million Gauls and took another million into slavery. Yes. Yep. He was also a brilliant politician, a brilliant general, like, and a, and a reformer of the, you know, cancerous Roman Republic. Yeah. And a salad. Yeah. No, that is a guy from Mexico. <laughs> that, guys, every year on March 15th, every year, I get sent two memes about the Ides of March. Someone, multiple people send me a picture of a Caesar salad dressing bottle with a knife through it. Every year. Every year. There's, there's only two jokes in Latin, and I get sent all of them on the, on the 15th of March. So I'll get to the end. But see, I knew that because you complained about it last year, Alan. Yeah. Did I really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's coming. Well, it's coming around again, guys. That's how, <laughs> that's how long you've been on BookTube, man. It's coming around again. You're a legend now. Uh, anyway, um, I agree. Empire, whatever. I just, I love how on the nose it is here. And it is something that we will continuously ask ourselves, even through the first six. Um, but it's a question that, I mean, you have to ponder and you have to wonder, and it's very easy to relate to our, our lives. And it's just interesting. You know, this is like a living history of, of Malazan and, and the Malaz Empire and seven cities and all these other different places and different cultures. And I think that Erickson does a phenomenal job of establishing other cultures uh, and making us wonder uh, what is the price of progress for those people? And is it correct to do so and to impose the, our will on them or the Malaz's will, right? Um I don't know. I really like that. It's one of my favorite things about the series. So I wanted to take time to make sure we recognize it, but we move on to part one of, and this is a phenomenal name. It's called the thousand fingered God. Mm. What a name. I love that. Uh, and we meet, and I am going to do this chronologically, uh, or at least we'll try to, uh, yeah. just to kind of keep pace with this, because what I really like about these is that people can come here and we can discuss this, but also good recap for, for some people. I don't want to recap everything, uh, but at least we'll have some kind of, of, sequence to events so uh samar dev how, 
we we meet Sam Ardev, who seems to be like an inventor. Uh, Karsa keeps calling her a witch, witch. Uh, which is one of those things where I'm like, is she really a witch or is Karsa a jerk? I think she is a witch, right? Yeah, she is exactly. a witch. Yeah. She is a witch. But I was immediately asking myself, yeah. I'm like, can I trust Karsa? Because everyone's children to him. I didn't even realize that Karsa actually wasn't murdering children until someone exp I missed it. Someone's like, mm -hmm. oh, no, he didn't actually murder children. I'm like, no, no, he did. He said it. And they're like, no, everyone's a child to Karsa. I'm like, oh, yeah. fair enough. Um, enough words, which but I you know, know she, Karsa. she's down bad. And, and who saves her? The night. <laughs> In shining armor, Carson. Sam Ardev comes in in this book. Yeah, I yes. I thought it was freaking House of James. <laughs> thought we already seen Sam. I love Sam Ardev. Her and yes. Carsa, her and Carsa are one of my favorite duos. I love yeah. her and Carsa. Yeah, witness, You're damn right. I, and you know another thing that I absolutely love uh, with these two is that Carsa fights a lizard and gets covered in feces. <laughs> Yeah. Whenever he goes and and go into that like lair and he's fighting the lizard and he's just covered in shit. Oh yeah, he, and yeah. he does it with his bare hands. Of course. Yes, and, and actually, to be honest with you, I wasn't sure. You know, it actually ended up being, I believe, a giant lizard. But I was like, is this the Kachin Chamal? Like, I was like, did he just kill a Kachin Chamal? It wasn't. It ended up being a lizard. But these are questions that I pondered uh, to myself while going through that. I thought that that was super endearing and I immediately loved Sam Ardev and uh, Karsa, that duo. Excellent. Yeah, I agree. Like they're one of my favorites to follow. Um, and this constant yeah. argument on progress and uh, it's just fascinating. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I was thinking too, Joanna. Uh, I love their ongoing debate about, this is kind of what we were talking about with the Romans and, and the Malazans. Mm -hmm. The ongoing debate about um, the benefits or deficits of civilization and mm -hmm. Samardev realizing that Karsa isn't just some ignorant barbarian, that he actually has his own kind of intelligence and that he's challenging her worldview. And that's part of the fun of the interactions between them, um, but also her putting him in his place and and uh, he seems to kind of enjoy that as well. So, yeah, there's a lot going on there, but I feel like that's a theme that's developed with this, this pair. Yes. Uh, that is really cool. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the and I've, thing. Yeah. I've read just a tiny bit of Robert E. Howard's Conan this last year, just a tiny bit, enough to see so much influence there of Conan on Carsa, especially the commentary about civilization, because that comes up right away in Conan's stories. <laughs> So I thought that was really interesting, but I love the way that Steven Erickson does it in this series. I love their discussions in this book. That it's amazing the way they both challenge each other. It's it's incredible to see that influence. Yeah, that's my favorite them. thing is Sam yeah. Ardev's like tempering influence on Karsa because yeah. he already is not the same person we met at the beginning right. of House of Chains. So being like part of the being part of Shaikh's rebellion with uh, Liamon and, and more importantly, uh, Felison and um, young Felison and all of that, like his, you know, it's he's kind of settled down and humanized and recognized that there are people other than himself. You know what I mean? Like otherwise, mm -hmm. why go after Bidathal, you know, if not to punish his yeah. um, his crimes? And then you have Sam or Dev who just further continues to, um, you know, sand off those rough edges that old Carsa has and their banter is some of my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we won't go into Reaper's Gale, but I do enjoy the fact that this is not just a one book affair, right? Oh, agreed. Agreed. So it's developed for a while. Um, at least I hope I'm getting that right. If I remember correctly, um, someone did correct me, by the way, it was not just a giant lizard. It was a contained Naruk. Is it Naruk? Yeah. They're, they're Philip, the short, is it Naruk? They're the short tails. That's how you'd say short that. Tails, um, yeah. I think you have someone else, the Riddler, saying it was a Kachain Jamal, but it, it was a Kachain something or other. I, okay. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I if I, if I remember right, I remember a short tail being yeah. described. Okay. So. I think it's okay. one of the short tails. Okay, yeah. so it's a short tail, and they were the ones who were like obsessive record keepers, right? But they did it on their own skin or something like that, right? What? Yeah, I, I believe that's a <laughs> I, I just I just thought they were short-tailed 
the short tailed lizards. Yeah. No, yeah. The Naruk were an obsessive, uh, obsessive recorders and they employed the skin oh. shed by the contained Shamal as oh. writing parchment. The skin was stretched and held in place oh. by frames. Yeah. I forgot about that. I forgot about, about that too. I forgot about that. I, I, like, I don't it's remember. When, when was that? Was that in this no. book? Yes, I believe that that happened in this book. Oh, At least the, the the recording where they find it. Yeah, isn't it whenever Ikarium and and Mappo are, you know, going inside crap? Is that in, is that in it, this book? If if anyone was going to find it, it would be those two. Yeah, yes. probably. Is that in this book where they do the? I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do. Ikarium and Mappo. They do go into a, in the sky keep, right? a bunch of sky keeps. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Is that this book? Yes. Okay. Okay. Cool. 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 Yeah. And um, so he beats that. And then I think it was reading rainbow pointed out that he says at the end, he said, well, that was rather pointless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carson continues to be the MVP of the series. Um, and we also get, so <laughs> Oh yeah. He's just a blast. Um, we get Absalar. Uh, and, and I really, really like Absalar. Like it's not, she's never been a, my favorite character by any means, but like, I really enjoyed her being torn up over losing Crocus. Mm -hmm. And uh, it actually was sad. Like it actually got me a little bit emotional. Um, and I also like that she had Cantillion's uh, or dancers memories. Right. And is then asked to dance at the bar. And then she's able to pull on that and perform. I, I just think that's the tiny stuff that reminds us of, of where she's been and where she's going. And uh, I absolutely love that. What did you think her. about her relationship with Cantillion in this? Oh, I, I loved it. Cotillion has risen fast in my favorite characters list for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, especially we know at the end of this book, right? He's his hand, hand. I think his head's in his hands. Like he's just like, all these people are dying. Like you can see that there's actual remorse, even though he's ascended uh, for the mortals that are losing their lives. Whereas I don't feel like we're seeing that from shadow throne. No, so. you got my boy shadow throne being like, excellent. I love it. When a plan comes together, <laughs> They're all going to exactly the right place. We'll see Cotillion. I love Shadow Throne. I love he's so, I love Shadow Throne. He, he would. Crazy old man. What are you doing, Kellen Ved? Freaking Lacine's messing it up. Go back and run the Empire. Though, I mean, he's crazy. He doesn't know. Oh, he's he's a, a psycho. I, um, I love, I love Kellen Ved. Yeah, Kel Kellen Ved's also a dope name. Um, yeah, it's an awesome name. Oh yeah, you want to learn about that name? You also have to read Path to Ascendancy. I know it. <laughs> Philip's actually just here to push us. He has affiliate yes. links in the description. I know. Isn't I it mean, it's there. It's there. It's actually there. So it's awesome. You learned about the origins of the name. But did you go back to Absalar? I, I loved her thread in this book, uh, mm -hmm. and this is my favorite Absalar book uh, because there's some beautiful moments. There's some. Interesting moments with Tellerest and Curdle later on. And then my, one of my favorite scenes, I think it's this book, is when she's on the ship and she has that conversation with Squint. The Squint, yes. And that is such a great scene. I just, uh, that, you were talking about how moving uh, her, her arc was here. That scene was where they're pretending not to know who the other one is. And so they can have just a moment of being a human, you know, without yeah. being this this legend of the, of, which has mostly kind of negative connotations to it. So uh, I loved that. That was really great. Ah, see, there my nemesis is. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so Telerast and Curdle do join Absalar, um, which I think there's a lot of cool stuff around them, but uh, we were actually just talking before we went live. Alan hates them. Um, <laughs> of course he does. Which doesn't <laughs> surprise me. He cheers for the, uh, you know, the genocidal maniac, but has a problem with the two animal companions that we get. Um, which I think says a lot about Alan as his mouth's full, so I can talk bad about him. I feel like it says a lot about Alan as a hater and a fake fan. And... I don't like these little dinosaur skeletons scurrying around, being like, ah, "What's happening here? Ooh, let's go investigate this. Oh no, don't do that. Oh, I hate you." Like, what are what is your purpose, Aston Curdle? What is your purpose other than to be? The raccoon and the bulldog from Pocahontas <laughs> traveling with Absalar. <laughs> like, and, and, you know, I finished the book, so I, I know what the purpose is, but I finished the series. I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't. I 
do, I do think we need to psychoanalyze, though, why you, your best imitations are the characters you hate the most. That's a good point. Because, <laughs> because, because the characters, because the characters I characters. like probably talk normal. Like, so you can't really do that. <laughs> you can only, like, talk like a normal person. Um, you know, except, and Carsa talks down here. Um, but <laughs> I don't know. I, I that's fine. I, I know, again, I'm in the minority. I know most people like uh, Tony Rice and Curl. And that's fine. Curl, I think he doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. That's brilliant. That was actually that's really good. That's brilliant. Oh, man. Sorry, not Oh, my Absalar. gosh, not Absalar. Oh, my uh, gosh. Well, th those two seem to be very afraid of Edgewalker, which Edgewalker was in Night of Knives. Mm. Um and I was glad I read that when I saw that. And I was like, okay, kind of cool. And it makes you wonder why they fear him so much. Um, and obviously he's kind of like, he's like a guardian slash slave to the house of shadow. Like it's very nebulous of what he, what he is other than there's a Who lot knows? of respect. Who knows? <laughs> is he an elder God? That's my Who question. Knows? <laughs> I have it in capital, capital letters in my notes. I said, is edge Walker. An See, elder even God? Pranav says that he's Pranav a perpetual mystery. Right. So if Pranav no says it, then yeah, you know it's a mystery. No <laughs> we know he's he's seen a lot of people come and go in that realm. So yes, yes, mm -hmm. and he kind of he kind of laughs at people who feel like they're taking advantage of that realm. He's like, oh, I've seen it before, folks. You know, uh, he's, he's been around the block. Um, and then there was a line, and I can't remember who said this. Um, Do not ask yourself where Dasim Altor is uh but rather who, oh, i'm sorry where is dasim altor but rather who is dasim and i put in capital letters bold oh shit because <laughs> i'm like <laughs> since the beginning since gardens of the mood i've been saying dasim where like where is he uh because i didn't believe he's dead not for a second and dead, jimmy <laughs> well we'll see we'll see it, we don't get that answer in, i don't think we got that answer in this book right i, I got that answer but i'm not gonna say anything Okay, well, I'll probably get down to my notes and figure it out. Um, we, are, we are told in the in this first book. book he is dead, Jimmy. Yes, well, yeah, and I can't say this is not a spoiler for other books uh, that are not in the main 10, so I cannot talk about said flashbacks. But uh, <laughs> Absalor runs into Urko Crust, a.k.a. Keeper from the House of Change, who, by the way, I forgot, knocked Carsa silly with yeah. one punch. Yes! Yes! You don't mess with Urko. No. Yeah, what, what's up with that? They're the crusts. The crust will wreck your face. Yeah. He says, Leoman says it's Karab. Interesting. So wait, Karab? Um, maybe maybe I, this is a... I love Korab. Korab is one of... Yeah. yeah, I really like Korab. I thought they were saying Dasim was Korab, and I was like, oh, okay. but uh, No, I love Korab. Yeah. I love Korab. We're gonna talk about him. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. Sorry. By the way, if the answer is not in this book, please don't put it in chat. Uh, but if the answer is in the book, feel free. Um, even though it's, I've read Reaper's Gale, it's I, not I, in this book. Okay. Well, we'll see. I'm, I'm still. Uh... Oh, so... <laughs> who is it, Philip? It was is my it, daughter. Is it? Da oh, you can answer it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a student. <laughs> um. <laughs> and we were talking about Mapo, Mapo and Akarium, uh, you know, going through. And this is where they do find the iced over ruins of the Can't Change Ma, who have short tails, a.k.a. Uh, the new Rook. You take such um, good notes. Thank you, Jimmy. I know. Uh, wow. It took me two and a half hours to go through my notes today. I had hundreds. Hundreds. These, I'll, I'm going to be honest. These uh, streams stress me out pretty hard. Because, really? <laughs> yeah, because I want to do a good job. Look, Jimmy, I last read this, again, December, December and January of 19. Or December of nineteen, January of, of two thousand twenty. So I just, I just want, to, yeah, but I just want to do my due diligence, you know, uh, and and provide good content as well as make sure that I remember everything. So it, yeah. it, it it's a, it's a give and take. I mean, it definitely helps me out as well. So, uh, but folks, did they find airplanes in those iced over ruins? Because I swear I read about airplanes in those iced over ruins. Did you guys catch that? Um, not airplanes per se. Well airplane like, like things you mean like flying I machines? Think I remember something like that i remember i read it twice and i was like i think he's alluding to some sort of flying craft well sky keeps, well, flying. Sky yeah. keeps are flying so is, is that what it was was it a sky keep? i think it is i think it are i think it is vessels that the that the the the, the, the naruk use in the sky keep to like fly to and from them i think i think it's i think they're just yeah anti-grab pods flying machines there you they go. certainly 
100%. Yeah. Okay, cool. I was making sure. Um, yeah, the, the Naruk are like Uber inventors. Yeah, that, I, I love that, by the way. I like thought when, that was awesome, too. In fantasy, if something crosses over to like ancient ruins of maybe an ancient civilization that was more Atlantis, I love that stuff. Like, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, now, this is one I can't remember, but I think this is our first introduction to Faradar, a Faradon sort. Yes, is that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. I hate Faradon. No! <laughs> no! Captain she Sword, stepped on Joyful Captain Union. Sword, she does make a airs. Like, I know everyone is up in arms about the freaking scorpion. I know. Like, <laughs> what's wrong with you? Bent, all bent out of shape because she stepped on the scorpion. She is trying to keep these idiots alive. She's that's her job. It's her job is to stop their foolishness. She will brook no more nonsense. You leave Farrah on sort alone. She's she a is, hero in this book. Thank you. Yeah. She's a hero. Well, I mean, Jimmy, she more than made up for it, right? By well, she, disobeying the orders and, and later yeah. on. Well, know, yes. Okay. Yeah, Jimmy, she but she waits she's... for them. Jimmy. Fine. Fine. I, I think it's apology. Sin. I think Sin's the MVP here. Not oh my gosh. Sin is Farrah on sort. Farron and Sword can kick rocks as far as I'm concerned. She will. And guess what's going to be under that rock? Joyful Union. <sighs> <laughs> oh, you're pushing it, bud. All right. Um, I like Joy. I like the Scorpion, this little Scorpion fights. I love the scenes with, with the Malisons. Like, just like campaigning is so boring. Like, I don't think people understand. My students don't certainly don't understand how long campaigning takes yes it's a long you don't just like march to the freaking place in two days you know kill them done go back home it's not a week-long thing it's months often years and most of it is hurrying up and waiting it's putting your stuff down oh yeah going to bed packing it back up walking more and then sitting around waiting for something to happen so i love I love the these moments like on how they freaking pass the time, how they keep from being afraid because, you know, like you I love it when he shows how scared they are um, for what's going to come. And so the ways that they relieve that 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 anxiety that they're feeling, the ways that they connect with one another and try to find um, the humor in the fact that they're marching to their deaths, you know, I love this. It's my favorite stuff. It's my favorite stuff in all the books is the stuff dealing with the Marines and the bone hunters and uh, the soldiers. Yeah. I used yeah. to be close to somebody who was an Iraqi veteran and he was an infantryman. And he said that most people would hate real war movies that depicted like real war scenes mm -hmm. because they would be bored to tears. <laughs> um, but I think that the way it's handled here, like what you said, uh, it, it's perfect. It's perfect the way that they they kind of communicate with each other, the way they bond together. And one thing that I love about the characters in the series, in this book and in other books, is how you get in their heads and you kind of learn some of their backstories, some mm -hmm. of their memories. So it's like they're kind of processing sometimes weird and challenging things that happened to them in the past. But I feel like that would normally, I mean, we're used to living in a civilization and time where if we have uncomfortable thoughts or feelings come up, we just grab our phones or go towards the nearest distraction. Yeah. But when you have that much time, things are probably going to come up and surface. Yeah. So it was just interesting. I think like in this book, I think it's Korik that we learn about some of his past. Mm -hmm. And if I'm thinking of the right character. I thought it was Dead Smell that had the really like disturbing one Maybe i could be wrong i don't remember <laughs> Korik is, the, is the is the exiled prince right he's oh, the one that, okay. isn't he the one that that hellion wants to do no Korik no. is, the, is the half seti okay oh. I'm thinking, i think Korik is he, he and the smiles one you know he and smiles are always fighting with each other ah uh, yes right. it's smiles and Korik that hate each other yeah. you're right and yeah. smile isn't does smile throw a dagger in like his thigh? Oh yeah, <laughs> smiles. Yeah, a relationship. Yeah, smiles is she smiles is, is great. She is angry. And, and when Farron on Sword is is kind of coming in and cracking skulls, uh, Bottle gives her smiles. Is like I'm smiles. Yes. I, and, oh my gosh, Jimmy, dude, that is so funny. I love that because smiles is so mean. <laughs> Darren, thanks for the five spice. Said I read this book and this chat makes me feel like I need to reread this book. Yeah, and Pranav is pulling up something that's in chapter three, Liam Liamon. Uh, not at all, you Opon blessed madman. My only friend left breathing, not at all. It is the cult you see, the Lord of Tragedy, Disombre. That is Dasim Altor. Um, so I guess that gives away. I, I still don't 
know who that is, but that's fine. Uh, if that's the giving out the uh, uh, identity, um, because I'm bad at this, uh, and I like how do you do, fellow kids? <laughs> I that's thought that a choice was meme right there. That's the quality meme. But to, to go back to Farad and Sword for a second, if yeah, could, I, yeah, I think that's a very Malazan thing to do to introduce a character that you immediately hate because she steps on the joyful union. Yeah. And then later to give you a different view of that character where you, you suddenly realize, okay, she's not a total, you know, meanie, uh, you know, right. so, and, and that often continues in later books as well. So, I mean, that's just a, it's a brilliant thing, but yeah. it's such a typical Malazan thing, isn't it? The yeah, part. it is. Yeah. I love Captain Sword. Oh. I mean, she was one of my favorites by the end. Yeah. And, and I do, I actually love her part in the story. It's just when joyful union is this big fan loving, you know, everybody talks about <laughs> it and, and then it just gets stepped on. You're like, damn. It's Being so honest, small, when though, I read compared that to what time. she does though, in this book. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm still not a fan, but when I read it the first time, I was also like, "What? Yeah, You're stepping on their this is the only fun they have." I didn't like her either when I, she was first introduced, but I like her now. Yeah, and poor Bottle, you know, he's he's traumatized by that, right? Poor yeah, and and they're like, merely like, I don't, I don't like sort, which is funny because she saves her lot. You know, she saves. Yeah. Her Do you guys ever think they ask too much of Bottle in these books? Like oh, they yeah. rely <laughs> so much on Bottle, like. They're always, dude, dude, do this. Uh, well, I don't know when it happens. So they're always trying to get him to do that rat thing, the rat trick. Uh, Pernat. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're, oh, I have I have some notes about the rat later. I got some notes on the rat. Yeah, um, they're, they're always telling him, like, talk to that animal. <laughs> uh, Pernat says, I also love the throwbacks to previous minor events, characters that add to the world's dynam uh, dynamic. Dynamism? I, I don't know. Dynamism. Yeah, we got it. We got it. All right. Uh, broke face being the guy whose face was bitten off by Fiddler's. I didn't Girl catch that. That's all. I, I mean, I'm never going to catch that. I, didn't I think yeah. that, Pernav's read this like five times. He, yeah. Well, he's, he's, he's on his first reread. I don't think. Yeah, I, he's, he's I made pretty brilliant. Though. Listen, <laughs> let, me, let me exaggerate. It sounds better. Uh, <laughs> that's what I think. Uh, so bottle speaking of bottle, he has a vision of Esriel or Arisol. I'm sorry, who mm -hmm. was pregnant. The child she carries having a tist ed, uh, tist adore father and being an abomination that loses innocence i don't know i put i don't know ask someone on stream because i i'm not sure what this signified later uh unless if i get to the bottom of my notes and it tells me uh but i remember being very confused by this and like trying to piece it together as i went and i couldn't figure it out uh, but i believe by the end we kind of have an idea of who that would be right but jimmy there's a there is a camp of us who love the books and don't really understand a whole lot about the aerosol and everything that goes on there. I am one of them. I really love these books, but sometimes it just gets too. I don't really. I just figured out my head. It. Oh, did you? Good. I because think because I just finished Reaper's Gale, but I can't talk about this on the stream. But I mean, if that is like, a vision that plays out in Reaper's Gale, I totally get it. And if not, then I'm an idiot. But whenever the aerosol appears, I don't really know what's happening. Yeah, I had forgot what they were and who they were. Philip uh, like knows. Philip can enlighten us. Well, I mean, the aerosol were a an ancestral stage of humanity, perhaps. They're like um, the proto humans, they, right? They go way, yeah. They're they're like uh, I don't know, Australopithecus afarensis or something. You know, they're just a, a, a an, at a, some earlier stage of evolution, mm -hmm. um, and they had uh, now whether the one we see is is, is some kind of goddess or, or something like that um mm -hmm. is is uh probably not entirely clear but i think that there is a connection here um it's it's a, again another malazan thing right so you have all these different races and a lot of uh we what we tend to do when we see races people different from ourselves is we we other them and but what you find often happening in malazan is this sudden understanding of connection and i feel like the aerosol often plays that role of opening people's eyes to their connections to other races other peoples to the past so the aerosol for me is linked to that theme of of uh, sudden understanding of one's connection to uh, something much broader than than maybe one initially felt, and and it often happens as a kind of revelation, and and usually you know the aerosol has a, a 
I perceive it as a, as a more benevolent influence. And so, uh, but yeah, that's about the extent of my wisdom on that. Um, I, I mean, that's pretty good, man. Off the top of your head, yeah. that's pretty damn yeah, good. Yeah, that's good. That's, uh, that's she really, good. really saves the day in this book, too. Right? Yeah, yeah. She, she, she helps does. a lot. To, like, yeah. it's, it's funny how it's interesting, by the way, how many heroes in this book are female characters. I was thinking about that later hmm. on. Don't forget yeah. Shadow Throne. <laughs> what? <laughs> does Shadow Throne not save everybody from the plague? Is, Shadow Is that not Shadow Throne? Shadow well, Throne? actually, it's Gano's par parent, really, isn't it? Yeah, Gano uh, saves him. But yeah, but he's doing what Shadow Throne like wanted. Okay, so so Shadow Throne helps um, yeah. with the the he sends the, the dogs. hounds. He sends the hounds. So yeah, definitely he plays a role there. Yeah. And you're, doesn't Absalar help with that too? Yes. Yeah. With I mean, hounds? why are yeah. they? Uh, steal. <laughs> it's all Shadow Throne's mastermind. He he planned it all. <laughs> it's his gambit. <laughs> Um, well, speaking of Shadow Throne and Cotillion, um, Kalam, Ben, and Stormy going into Moonspawn, holding a ton of uh, a, a Moonspawn, I said, even though it's not a Moonspawn, it's a, it's a Sky Keeper or whatever, yeah. uh, with the Kachain Chamal um, that's being held. I said, what could go wrong? <laughs> Cotillion lets us know Stormy is an ascendant or a god of some sort. And it would, see, uh, uh, it would seem, and Kalam wonders what secrets about Quick Ben Cotillion knows. And this is not the first time that Kalam has wondered about the truth or the further knowledge that quick Ben might have. And I feel like you're constantly getting little tidbits of like quick Ben might not be all that he appears to be, or maybe he's a lot more rather. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 I like those moments like Kalam and quick Ben, another duo that I absolutely love. And I like stormy a lot too. Um, seems like a, a good dude. Uh, I like then, stormy also and Gessler. Yeah. I like Gessler quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I always get them mixed up if I'm being honest with you, just because their names are a little bit more general than a lot of the other things. And, and uh, they've kind of been in the same places. I, I think always get those Stormy is, the, is Stormy the one with the red beard. Am yeah. I thinking yeah. that right? And Stormy, <laughs> I think Stormy used to be above Gessler and then got right. bumped down. And now Gessler is his superior. His sergeant, right? Yeah. Yeah. Their dynamic is hilarious. Oh, they're the best. They they're are interesting. The best. Yeah. They're pretty. Uh, we could get a novella with those two, and I would be totally fine with that. Oh, the, you, they are the best. I love Stormy and Gessler. Yeah. And truth. And truth. That is well, true. <laughs> I mean, not anymore. So, <laughs> uh, as Alan laughs and cackles, <laughs> it's just like I forgot. I mean, I knew truth was there, but I thought he was already gone. And then when Philip said and truth, I'm like, oh, wait, that is this book. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> so we close out part one with uh, the Dejim is, is what I'm going to call them. Uh, they attack Mappo and Akarium, uh, mm -hmm. and I assume the Nameless Ones are probably mad at Mappo at this point because the, he didn't follow through on Akarium's imprisonment, mm -hmm. uh, and we're kind of left with a cliffhanger uh, of what happens here, and obviously this is going to play out later. But part two, uh, I just have in big capital letters, the Siege of Alan Yigatan. Yeah, do you want to say yeah I, I was feeding you the line because yes, I know the Siege of Yigatan. Take yes. it away, Alan. Take it away. He ran away with the Yigatan. <laughs> I got if we're gonna talk about it, I gotta get my supplies. Oh, which dear. is my get your olive honey. oil for here. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like Yigatan, first of all, Liamon, like not knowing what Liamon's freaking plan is the whole time. It's like, what are you doing, Liamon? Yeah. Like, what are you doing? I really liked Liamon until yes. this book. Yes, uh, and me too. This book, I freaking hate him. Yeah. I hate him after this book. I liked Liamon a lot in uh, Dead House Gates and House of Chains, and I freaking despise him now. Useless piece of trash. Like, you suck, Liamon. And, you know, watching him make the plans, I'm like, what are they doing? With all that freaking olive oil. Like, what are they doing? I didn't know what they were doing. And then, man, on the way, and then Korab being like, Leomon, I will serve. Like, I love stu stupid Korab. I love, I love how dumb he is. Um, and when he lights, sorry, that was my plate. When he lights that bloody oh, city on fire, like, my mouth dropped. I was yeah. like, holy crap. And the fact that they do everything anyway, like they go in, like everyone's going to die since they're trying to, you know, do something with the freaking flames. Um, and 
you know, they have to go, they go into the building, right? And that's where truth dies, right? Because they have to go into the building. Because freaking Leomon leaves, leaves well, he, Korab behind. He makes a deal with the Queen of Dreams. Yeah. Well, he, and, he invites Korab to go with him. And Korab's, and Korab's like, I will no. have nothing to do with you any longer. Because, and that's when you really start loving Korab. Yeah, right? because what he's doing is wrong. He's yeah. literally abandoning the entire remnant of the whirlwind, abandoning all of his troops so that he can save his sorry skin along with freaking Dun Sparrow. Because all of a sudden, Whiskey Jack has a sister who is, you know, hanging out with freaking Leomon. And oh, yes, Dun Sparrow. Yeah. What? Where are my answers? Who the crap is Dun Sparrow? Where's Leomon of the Flails? Here's Philip's going to lean in and say, you know, Alan, if you want to know about Leomon and the Flail, <laughs> yes. you need to read <laughs> the Wait, No, are you kidding? Yeah, uh, you have to read uh, novels of the Lazen Empire. I love it. <laughs> this is tremendous. You're, we're probably going to love him again. <laughs> no. No, I refuse. I re Well, who do I hate more? Taylor or Leomon? I don't know. Um, but it's just- Leomon. Like it is so intense. The, the description of the siege and the you could feel the heat coming off and their desperation as they try to like uh, they try to you know go underground, find that underground passage and everything that's going on, and then truth gets blown up. You know, it's, yeah, cash is on fire. The claustrophobic nature of the whole thing. When is... they are in the underground passage and they oh, are being guided yeah. by bottles, rat alone. Yeah, yeah. and just how. Hellion has to, she's trying to stay drunk because if she gets sober, she's just going to have an absolute panic attack. Yeah. And, you know, and Korab, freaking Korab taking, it's Korab that carries Fiddler, right? Absolutely. Yes. Oh, yes. So, oh I just got chills. Yeah. And when they, so when they good. have the honey, um, that is yeah. so much development for so many different people in yeah. those little scenes. I mean, it's master level development, in my opinion. There's so much to that chapter. I mean, even just before we go it's the best into the too, so good. some of the things happening there. I can't remember if it was, I always want to say Ken Ebb, and I'm always like, that's probably not even right. But yeah, you're fine. there was like something about somebody getting cooked in their armor or something. Mm -hmm. Or and I was thinking, oh, they're dead. And somehow they lived in Lestara almost dying too and oh yeah where, where it she's like on an island like oh, a yeah. rock that becomes an island and everything's melting around it's like a river and <laughs> she's crazy. like surviving oh it's all inspiring Absolutely the imagery is terrifying. tremendous crazy it's and just like the decision I, I brought this up before i know but like the decision to go into the city just blew my mind like with fiddler and and crew to begin with just that's to, their job like that's, that's what, amazing that's though i know it's, it's the so, first yeah, and last out mentality but it just it still blows my mind and comparing that these guys who go in knowing what's happening compared to freaking leomon who mm -hmm. uh, do not abandon your troops i'm sorry it is the the commander does not leave the troops behind not no no contrast that with freaking fiddler Contrasted with Fiddler, who, you know, stays behind to make sure everyone gets mm -hmm. into the freaking hole, which is, you know, why he's dying. And then Korab, Korab carrying him while, you know, the previous chapter thinking that the Malazans were, you know, the bane of existence, the, you know, the enemy of the whirlwind. And just how quickly Korab's worldview changes with seeing what Leomon is doing. Then he sees the Malazans, what they yeah. are doing. And yeah. he is like, oh my gosh. And he's so dumb, but I love Korab. He's it's so you know, it's interesting too. I was trying to look through my notes um, before this and there, I mean, there's a part where Leoman actually tells Korab, your loyalty to me is going to be tested. Like he tells him that it's like, <clears throat> I think Leoman knows that Korab probably isn't going to stay the course. Well, and another thing is, is we can draw a very direct correlation between Leoman's mysterious ways and Corb having to trust him to Tavor and how she is also very nebulous with her reasoning for doing things and how she's going about it. And we see like Blistig and people start to wonder about her. And, you know, if, if we know anything about ambiguous uh, actions that aren't being explained, it, it, this would be the track record to say, yikes. And I think it's this is the chapter where Blistig sees like an omen or something. Right. And he sees at the adjunct Tavor in a burning world. Mm. And it's like, yeah. who's the who's the red blade captain? The one that is cooked, and then he just like loses his crap and is just rude the whole time. What's that I, guy's I, name? I don't know. the T? Name. Starts with a T. You have to look I in the crack. Cr cr crack it open, Philip. <laughs> crack it open. Um, one Except of the quotes I Tenebaralta. Tenebaralta. Oh. There you go. Uh, okay. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, that guy sucks. <laughs> um, Wiccans don't ascend, we iterate, was also a really good quote from this that I think is maybe a little bit telling. Okay. Um, and we find out Sin's a high mage during all this, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which Sin is awesome. I love Sin. Uh, mm. Sin and, is uh, weird. <laughs> yeah, Sin is Sin, weird. Sin comes in in House of Chains, right? That's where Callum meets her? Uh, I think, I think so. that's right. Yes, yeah. that but is correct. Sin, to me... Outside the siege, and she's pretending to be, you know, helping the, the rebels. Or, yeah. yeah. Sin was confusing yeah. for me in this book because for some reason, when I read House of Chains, I thought Sin was, like, older than she actually is. Oh, really? And in this book, she's like a kid. And she, I, she, I did not think she was a kid in House of Chains. I thought she was like a teenager. And then here she's like, you know, a kid. And I, I, it was very confusing for me. I'm probably the only one that had that problem. But I was just like, is this yeah, I, I didn't. I literally had to go pick up House of Chains and look. Is this the same character? It was very confusing. For I'll me. be honest. I, I barely remember enough to be like, to have any distinction. Like if, oh, if Steven Harris could have said that she was a, a, a cat in this book and I've been like, yeah, probably. Like, oh, <laughs> I just yeah, kind of accept maybe. what he tells me. Maybe that's why, because it was four books back. Yeah. Dead House Gates. That's right. Um, oh, so we talked about right? Was it Dead House Gates? No, well, it's, it's House of Chains. No, it's House of Chains. Okay, yeah, because yeah. Right. Didn't, anyway, it's not really that important. <laughs> but it kind of is, right? Because she's kind of. I mean, she came from probably a, a. I guess the implication in this book is that she came from such a traumatic past that that's mm -hmm. why she's choosing. She's not actually mute. I don't. I don't think, but. She's no. choosing to be mute, and I mean, she's yeah, she's got well, it's also some, some issues going on for sure. Yeah, I don't like I don't like sin. Well, you have that much power when you have that much power going through you, it it changes you. you no. know? Yeah, she's well, not basically a victim of of the, her own power in a sense, uh, and you see that happening to various high mages that if they channel too much of this through them they're basically like a conduit right mm -hmm. and if you channel too much energy through a conduit you're you're going to kind of melt it down you know and that's yeah. kind of what's happened in a way to her i think so. it's also further proof that this is not um that magic obviously is power but it's also not hoarded by people with just wealth or of a certain training or anything it can be hereditary it can be natural mm -hmm. uh, and anyone can possess it which then makes it a very much more interesting world in my opinion yeah. um yeah so can Jimmy, can we talk a little bit more about that? Um, how how they that that bonding between yeah. um, Fiddler, Fiddler and um, Cora? Cora? Yeah, absolutely. That, cool. That's the part that just shook me to my core. Um, and, and the whole thing. I mean, yes, the 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 flames and the the godling that was born and all the the, the combat, oh. all of it was just man, it was it was tremendous. But what had me just you know, <laughs> blubbering at the end of it all was that bond that formed between, hey, Rob, the bond that yeah. formed between these two. So Korab went into this thing thinking that Malazans ate babies. Yeah. He hated mm -hmm. Malazans. And the idea that two that, that these two individuals could form such a bond in spite of the, the prejudices that existed ahead of time. Yes. That's such a powerful thing. That's such a great, important message, I think, for our world today. You know, you know that you might think that these people are evil. They're the scum of the earth because they're this, this, that. And, and you have all these conceptions. And then these two people have such a power. With Korab, we see him going from thinking that Malazans eat babies to insisting on being the one to carry Fiddler mm -hmm. out of there even though it puts him himself at, at more risk. And just that, that whatever formed between these two in that moment, what was forged beneath the earth there as they were, they're basically struggling to survive such a powerful thing. I mean, that, that's a, that's a Malazan moment that is, is definitely among my, my top, whatever <laughs> top 10 Malazan moments. I, well, mean, I have so it in my, I have it in my notes actually for that because he has a moment where Korab, uh, Korab thinks he says he was no believer in causes, not anymore. Certainty was an illusion, a lie. Mm -hmm. Fanaticism was a poison in the soul, and the first victim in its inexorable, ever growing list was compassion. Yeah. Who could speak of freedom when one soul was bound in chains? Yeah, when I mean, wow. yeah, I mean, it requires yeah. uh, changing your opinion, <laughs> requires the admission that you don't know everything. 
and that yep. if there's new information, you process it. And, you know, and that requires nuanced thinking, which is why we have, you know, that's why we have such problems now is demonizing the other, because if you humanize them, well, then, then how do you explain, how do you explain your actions? Like if you're, if you're acting this way to people and not the enemy, you know, that, that's what, I mean, that's, that's the whole reason that soldiers can cut each other down. They can't, the Malazans can't think that the, uh, the Shaikh's uh, whirlwind have families and children and like, they can't think that way. Because uh, right. human beings can't function. Like, we can't function that way. The human psyche can't take it. You must turn them, like, you have to turn them into, into statistics. They have to be in yeah. human or enemy or numbers because then, you know, then you can actually go and do it because it's not it's not in our nature to, you know, bolo. I mean, maybe it's in freaking Liam of the Flail's nature. But sure, most, certainly. Yeah, but, and so... I love that. I love that, that, that whole yeah, thing about the, that, that quote about fanaticism and zealotry that's, you know, straight out of freaking Thucydides wrote the same thing about the Peloponnesian war mm. about how the great, the Spartans and the Athenians, they could not, no Greek was talking to each other. They just, they just killed. And if you tried to moderate, you were, there was a sign of a coward and they would literally exile you. Like it, he says like uh, fan, fanatic devotion, um, fanatic zealotry was like the, the mark of a real man. Like you just, they were the other and you were and you know, you were in the right and, you know, ne'er the twain shall meet. And so I love dealing with that. Like having, requiring empathy for your fellow human being, like we need more of that now. We need more Korab and Fiddlers. Reach sure. out One thing I want to bring up too is that there's also this wonderful quote in that section. And it's basically when Bottle is going through his journey with the honey and there's this wonderful quote where he has this sort of dream about or memory of an ape behind bars. Mm -hmm. And the quote is compassion existed when and only when one could step outside oneself to suddenly see the bars from inside the cage. Mm -hmm. And I love that quote. I'd love to hear what you all think of that quote in relation to empathy and compassion. Yeah, I mean, I. I actually kind of like that one more <laughs> because it's, it's a little bit more vague uh, and a, a little bit more open for interpretation, but it's positive too. Yeah. I, I, to oh yeah. Yourself in other people's shoes. Like you have yeah. to be able to see things from, see something from someone else's perspective because most of the stuff that we right now in our culture, so vehemently disagree on, like violently disagree on mm. it, it is not because the other people are monsters. They don't think this way because they hate this and this and this, or they're they're hateful, spiteful, wanting to bring down this, and they just don't care about. That's not actually true. They just have a different perspective. Yeah. People like most people are trying. They believe what they think is right, and they most people, not Leamon of the Flails, have a decent reason. For at least normal people, not politicians. Once they enter politics, their opinions null and void. It's all bleh, all violated. But regular people <laughs> believe things for a reason, and it's usually not malicious or evil. But we don't stop. And even those of us who think that we're on the side of the angels, that we have the righteous mm -hmm. indignation, our side is right. Look at those ignorant morons. Yeah. And the irony is, while we're calling them ignorant morons, we are also doing the same thing and demonizing them. Not everybody is, you know, a monster. And it's really hard to do that, especially in what they're saying. You vehemently and like just to your core disagree with. Oh, it's, certainly. It is so hard to see that other side. But that's what he's talking about. Like, you've got to yeah. have that compassion for someone else because, you know. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's well, yes, so it does, I, absolutely. Actually, yeah. I have a question, and I would love to hear what you what you all think. But like, I mean, is there is there a is there a point where it's okay, like, to say I understand you feel that way, but like, I don't think it's owed to have um, a relationship with that person. Does that make sense? Like. Like, where does that compassion line? Where is it drawn? Is it just saying, okay, you think that. Okay. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, it's not. So, Jimmy, it's like. Do you know what I'm like, saying? I, I'm so having forgiving. a hard time. For, unforgiveness is, is drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. All right. But forgiving someone for what they have done does not mean reconciliation. You can forgive them because that's good for you. You don't have to then, it, you okay. know, hang out with that person or spend any time. You don't have to do that. That is not owed to anybody. But 
forgiving is for you, not for the other person. So you can, so I think that's what this is. Like you can, um, you don't, you don't owe it to engage with them. I mean, unless you're Philip, who uh, clearly, I don't know why I didn't see it before. Doesn't Leomon wear tweed in the show, in the, in the book? <laughs> <laughs> like, I think I remember him having like a tweed, like a tweed chainmail shirt. Um, <laughs> So like, I think you can disagree with someone, but that doesn't mean you have to like hang out with them all the time. You can just not hate that person or not, you know, say well, think, horrible things about that person. And I think some people misconstrue not speaking or not supporting with hating. Yeah, Ooh. absolutely. And I just want to go back to something you were saying earlier, Alan, because you were saying that understanding that people are kind of locked into their ways of thinking and believing and the mm -hmm. way that I interpret that quote is the ability to step outside. Compassion existed when and only when one could step outside oneself to see the bars from inside the cage. And meaning we're right. all guilty of this. We're all guilty of of believing believing our thoughts and you know of uh, succumbing to our thoughts and beliefs. And so, in some ways, we're no better than other people that also just are going off their own thoughts and beliefs. And the more that we're able to do that for ourselves, like, oh, I do that. And maybe, um, so it's kind of an act of introspection that leads to compassion and empathy. I guess that's how I interpret that quote. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm guilty of this all the time. Like my, my villain, because it makes me, it gives me a villain to fight is my school board in my district. And so it's easy to be like, what are these people doing? Like clearly don't care about education. They are out to ruin these kids' lives. And I have someone, a friend of mine works like around the, the school board. So they're around them a lot. They film stuff. And he tells me, he always tries to like be like, Alan, like I get what you're saying, but I see these people at their like meetings and stuff. Right. And it's not, it's not all what you say. So I'm right. Some of the time, like some of the things are like, what are y'all doing? But some of it is, you know, like people, the, the pop, the public won't let them do it or stuff like that. And so, I mean, that's always really humbling when that happens because, you know, I need, I need it to be someone's fault. Why does this freaking, why does our school system suck? It's gotta be somebody's fault, but it's just, it's hard to see the school board as humans doing their best rather than, you know, Liam yeah. of the flails. And I guess it makes you wonder like if the whole institution is just incorrect. I mean, what I mean by that is maybe we're just doing it wrong. I mean, I think, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation. I think we're doing a lot of stuff wrong. I think the world could be a lot more fair if people made decisions uh, well, that considered other people instead of just themselves. I've said this to Philip before, uh, our first episode of chatting with nuts. And I said, one of the things I love about fantasy is that it gets to be a reinspection of how to do things. And a lot of times, uh, it, not a lot, all yeah. the time in our world, as soon as something is made Canon, uh, in reality, uh, I use this example already. Right. But I said, cars, like we made cars one way. And now we've improved on that model constantly and constantly. And now we have pretty efficient cars. But was there like a different way of doing it? Was there another way of making a car? Now, saying that might sound ridiculous. Someone might say, no, that's why they made it the way they did. But without really taking a step back, it makes you wonder, like, how could we have accomplished some of the things we've done in a different way? Um, and I, that's what Absolutely. I kind of I mean, not only just in world building and in, you know, in technology or that kind of thing and not even just in politics, but even just in human to human interaction, because if we don't see that modeled in our daily life, uh, it's really hard to implement that in our lives. But if we could see that in fantasy, I think that that can be an inspiration or a launching point or a place where we can actually conceptualize different ways of being in the world. One of the main reasons I like fantasy is because the scrappy underdog can win in fantasy. Like the scrappy underdog can right the wrongs of society where, I mean, is it possible in the real world? Maybe. I mean, I mean yeah. it's happened before. That's, it's not common. That's one of the things I love about the Malazan books. And this is a, a theme that I, I maybe my favorite theme, and I've talked about it before with AP and, and with other people, but it's this message. I, I think that if this is a personal belief of mine is that we as a species are, we're in big trouble if we don't figure out how to transcend our tribalism. And what the Malazan books do for me is they show me ways in which both negative and positive examples where, you know, examples of where people, the consequences of us not transcending our tribalism, but then it gives us these beautiful moments like the Korab Fiddler 
where we do. And there's such a beauty in that. And such a, you think that, oh, maybe there's hope for our species when, when you see those kinds of interactions. And I think they're reflections of, of things that do happen and can happen in the real world. So the, the necessity to transcend our tribalism is a huge theme in here and, and the consequences if we don't, you know, um, because we've been pretty destructive and not just in terms of other people, but all the other creatures that we're here with, you know? Yeah. And that's, I mean, I mean, such a, that's, that's another uh, yeah. leap yeah. for people. Well, yeah. and it's such a power. It's so profound in the example of Fiddler and Korab, because I, I know we've discussed this before in our battle and leadership video discussion, but Korab, he made that decision. You know what I mean? He could have just as easily stuck to his guns and decided that the Malazans were evil or just run away or, you know, but the fact that he made a choice to help them to change his mind, to change his perspective and to act on that was so big on his part. It's not something that I think just any person would do. And same with Fiddler. I think that Fiddler coming around to Korab too, mm -hmm. uh, just, it's just amazing to see them both make that decision to come towards each other, to form that bridge. Because I, I think it just shows, oh, wow, there is that option. We never would have considered that before, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I just think it's very profound in that example. That <laughs> that yeah. definitely got to me emotionally too. I, I definitely teared up at the end of that chapter. Yeah. Yeah. It, it involves like, it involves thinking out, like we, we deify the self, like we do, like we are the most important person in the universe and everything spins around here, everything. Mm -hmm. Like if we, if those were two Americans, like see ya, like they're gone, you know, they're going to leave each other behind. Like, cause Korab, even after choosing not to go with Liamon could have just left Fiddler there and saved his own skin. You know what I mean? Like, yes. It's choosing, exactly. it's mm -hmm. choosing other people, choosing to, to have compassion or feelings for someone besides ourselves, even when it may not be the best decision or the best outcome, best being in quotes, for ourselves. Like, heaven forbid, we make a decision that is good for multiple people as opposed to the decision that's going to maximize our gain maximize our glory maximize yeah. our our personal like you know and it made me it made me wonder about the rats too because like I love the rats. there's I, a commentary about the rats the right rats being the ones that lead them out but the way that the rats kind of work together and sort of yes have... <laughs> that was what i was going to bring up is that rats they're hear me yeah they're kind of a a simile for what's going on uh before our very eyes do you guys think bottles gonna become a deity to rats <laughs> no i legit like i legit wrote my notes i said prediction i believe that bottle will ascend as like a rat god i mean Philip i really I thought he would i really bugs, did so. what's that it, i was gonna say that philip is gonna tell you if you want to know more about bottle uh ascending to <laughs> you need to read the asshole <laughs> <laughs> think that one's in a sale yeah. Have you read a sale yet, Philip? I haven't. No, I still need to read the last two books in the no novels of the Malazan Empire. But uh, yeah, I'll get there soon. <laughs> the rest of us are all going to have to buddy read the paths to path to ascendancy. Oh, I'll read it again. I, I would read it again. Yeah. Oh, I've got that'd stone, be great. Stone I was thinking next. we should all have a discussion on those. That'd be fun. I've got Stone Wielder first. I gotta get. I gotta. I gotta get through Stone Wielder, and I need to know what happens to Liam on the flames. Stone Wielder is great. That's where you go. You go to the wall. The storm wall. Storm wall. Yeah. It is. Wow. I hear the wall. I'm thinking it's like that. Not that wall. wall. <laughs> it's it's similar, but with water. My eyebrow, eyebrows perked up. So. Oh, I think you'll, you would, you would love Stone Wielder. Uh, I definitely. I, if it has anything like that in that concept, yeah. I'm in. Philip said naval combat, and I'm like, I'm there. Best naval battles in Dude. all of fantasy. I am. Stone Wielder. Naval battles, but no naval gazing. Right? No. <laughs> no, I'm okay with that kind of navel gazing. If there's someone looking out over their navy, I'm like, I'm okay with that. Like surveying their fleet, that's fine. And I also don't want naval like belly button battles. <laughs> oh no! Oh, you're not into that? That sounds a little weird. Yikes. Yeah, yeah, me either. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we're never going to get to Malaz. Not a chance. Oh, no. we have yeah, to, we're I mean, never. I may have to dip out early. There's no chance we we get through this. 
Oh no, no, we're, we're going to get through it. So to, to wrap no, up, <laughs> to wrap up part two, uh, we figure out the Mapo is now separated from Ikarium. Ikarium is being uh, taken advantage of by a guy named Terralac Veed, which we know. I hate Terralac Veed. I'm sure it's you. Rude, you Terralac Veed. Actually, I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> Alan, uh, Alan, Alan. No, 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 no! Don't do it, <laughs> dude. <laughs> the the constant phlegm in the hand. Uh, I mean, yeah. that's how I style my hair. So. <laughs> I felt like I had a good <laughs> like feed. You know? I hate Teralac feed. This is this every is scene that starts with him spitting in his. <laughs> this is the book where like the Mapo and Akarium storyline finally like hit its hit like it finally hit me. And I was like, okay, I love these two. And right as it's happening, like it starts when they're exploring the sky cape, I'm like, yes. And then right as it's happening, freaking Teralac feed shows up and ruins everything. And Mapo is taken or Mappos jumped by the thing, the hyena thing. And, uh, you know, Ikarium is off yeah. being like, Oh, do I know you? Yes. We've been friends for forever. Like I, oh, it's such a deceit. Long. It's like a gaslighter. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He's, he's got, he's telling him, uh, things like that. He destroyed an Azeth house, which to us as the readers, like what in the world are you talking about? Yeah, freaking um, but to close out part two, we get a very important part that I think a lot of us are forgetting, and that is Mapo is rescued by the one, the only, Iskaral Pus. Yes. And I would need to read this quote. I think it's really <laughs> impactful, and it really changed my life. Uh, and it says, uh, you need a haircut, Magora, and I'm just the man to do it. Come near me with, <laughs> come near me with intentions other than, uh, other than Amorous, and I'll stick you. Amorous, what a horrible thought. What if I told you I was pregnant? I'd kill the mule. She left at him squealing, <laughs> then spitting and scratching. They rolled in the dust. The mule watched them with placid eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what if I said I was pregnant? I'd kill the mule. Best line in the whole series. <laughs> I love those two. Forget together. the commentary on capitalism, on tribalism, <laughs> all that. I hate, Fine. I hate, I hate his girl puss. I but hate his wife. <laughs> I hate but they're so funny together. I, I think they crack me up. Oh, Super Games Bro says you guys rock. I don't even read these books, but I love listening to y'all talk. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, that that line, what if I told you I was pregnant? I'd kill the mule should get everyone in the I world. Mean, that's a good line. These books. That's a good line. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't make us girl puss not How about this? I think it's the funniest thing I've ever read in a book. I, I think these Malazan discussions have to be so hilarious to listen to if you haven't read the books. Um, I have yeah, a friend talking about I have a friend who comments on every single video and he commented on our I won't spoil anything, but on our Toll the Hounds video and just some of the things he said, it just cracked me up. <laughs> I was picking up from the series. Well the text is the text is very yeah. dense, but it's very relatable uh, yeah. in a lot of ways. And and it's very humorous in my opinion. But if I like... you hear it from the outside, you know, it's just <laughs> Dude, sounds so silly. Pust and Magora could not remind me more of my my grandma and grandfather. Both have passed on now, uh, rest their souls. But uh, I'll never forget this, and I probably shouldn't say this on stream. But uh, my <laughs> my grandparents were fighting, so I'm outside with Grandpa. Grandma is inside with my mom, and I come back in and I go, "Mom, Grandpa was out there saying he hopes Grandma dies," and <laughs> she goes. Your grandma was in here saying the same thing about him. <laughs> <laughs> saying, I just go, oh, I can't wait till he kicks the bucket. And like, <laughs> I, I feel that when I read Pust and Magora, and it's like cozy oh. in a traumatic way for me. You know, I, I really enjoy it. That's fun. <laughs> oh, Matt says, I tried book one, just couldn't get into it. it I mean, it, it's a hard series to get into at first, but then like, yeah, devote time to your 100%. Like it is an all in kind of thing, in my opinion. Um, at least while you're reading that one book. Um, I just man. don't have a sense of humor. So that's that's clearly my problem. God, Alan. I know. You don't think my grandparents wishing death on each other is hilarious? That's terrible, Jim. I got way so, worse stories. Than that. Please don't tell them. <laughs> my mom's by watching and laughing and also so, shaking her head. So terrible. But Magora and Puss really do remind me of my grandma and grandpa because of the bickering. And like, I look back on that fondly for whatever reason. Like, it, it yeah. amuses me. So uh, that's why I like Puss so much. Uh, mm -hmm. and Magora. But that's how you show affection sometimes, you know? And you can see oh. that among the Malazan Marines and, and you know, the soldiers and they're constantly saying stuff like that to each other. And, and you know they love each other. That's what that is, Alan. It's love. 
Yeah. Iskaral, you cannot compare what Iskaral Pust does with the freaking Marines. They are not, the Marines don't sit around doing the, you know what they, you know what he does. He does it every time in every book. He's leading someone to their doom and talk. Oh, now I will lead them into the trap that they have not seen before because they are ignorant. Yes. Dude, we're right will you here. please oh, say I have right. been discovered. I must act like I must act like nothing is wrong, and they will I will lure them into complacency, and then they will stumble into the trap again. <laughs> will you please say I'd kill the mule in that voice? I'd kill the mule. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, uh, you know, uh, if, if Steve is out there, Steven is out there watching, please hire Alan to do the audio. <laughs> no, I, there's no, I don't, I don't want him to see my impression of us. Darren, thank you for the <laughs> another spot. Five spots. So says two enter, one remains. Dr. Fantasy versus the library of Alan. Pessimist versus Optimist. Who will win? Stay tuned. Well, clearly I'm the optimist. <laughs> what? How would I, I be the pessimist? I, I think you're, th this is, this is a, uh, whenever we have group therapy on Friday, um, which is nice, we'll, 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 we'll talk, we'll talk about the, the difference. Well, between what did you all think of gray frog, by the way? What did you think? Of, did you like gray frog? Alan? Did I like is gray this frog? First book? He wasn't in house of chains. He was in house of chains. Okay. He was, but he's more featured in this book. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. gray frog reminds me, I just picture a slog for anyone that played D and D the planner toad people that are evil. Mm -hmm. That's all I pictured. Um, yeah. I like Greyfrog. Like he grew on me in this book way more than the last book. Um, I like how he is like, you know, kind of protective of these people. He doesn't eat them, which is very nice. That uh, is very nice of him. Because he eats yeah. everybody else. But then, you know, he gets like, he gets big cromps, like just cut in half. Like, done. Sorry, oh, Greyfrog. End yeah. of game. Yeah. So I like Greyfrog. But what? Does he come uh, back? He's not quite. Well, well, well I'm forgetting this. Oh. Well, Cutter and Haboric and Gray Frog, they're, they're all attacked yeah. by the teal and a mass. Um, and it's like a group of flies and insects, and they end up coming in. And that ends part two. Part three, which we're getting into now, right. um, is when we kind of find out what's happened uh, to, to them. Um, oh. Which I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I think we find out Gray Frog's not dead, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I thought so. I was making sure. Yeah. Um, this is where my notes get insane. My memory must be really fuzzy on this, this fuzzy on this for some reason. Well, I he, I mean, he, he appears to be dead, very dead, but uh, he he comes back and then um, oh, Lorik shows, shows up and he goes back back to Lorik because he was Lorik's yes. kind of. Oh, buddy, right? OK. And Lorik's looking familiar. for Fellas and Younger who is now gone yes. and right. Felicity Younger has been taken by the, those teal on a mask that took them. And we find out that she is to be the Shaiq reborn. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, is, is this, is house of, Ch what do we know about the whirlwind from house of chains? Does the whirlwind end in house of chains? Or is that this book? Well, house of chains ends with Felicity and Tavor and Tavor kills Felicity. But I mean, like, the, no, the I mean, world, the yes. Yeah, Alan, it, it ends uh, in a way. Drijna, it ends at the end of House of Chains. So and then Leomon was running. Okay, so we figure out the whirlwind goddess stuff in House of Chains. That's not this book. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know when they dealt with that because isn't is Gray Frog not there for that? No, that's freaking no. I'm so confused. I'm when, just when, confused. They're, when they're they're ambushed by the uh, Flanamas, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Gray Frog is is killed, but then he he kind of sheds his skin and he sort of comes out of that, and so yeah. he's actually not actually quite dead. Um, yeah, and, and then yeah, he goes off Loric to, and then Loric shows up. Okay. And, Lor and yeah, and then Loric's also mad uh, that Barathal's around. He's not happy about that because we know that Barathal ran from Aaron. Apparently, left the gates open. People blamed him, and then there was like a rebellion in his name. So we get some backstory on Barathal. It's a, a lot of stuff happens at this. This is a huge moment, not just from the car carriage jump, but everything like just kind of pops off here. Um, and that's when we find that the teal and a mass are bound to the cripple God. They are there. I'm sorry. They're actually called the unbound, yeah. <laughs> which is funny because they're serving the crippled God. Um, and I think Kulat is the one um, I'm trying to remember. AP. Right, AP. The AP. He, tr he tried. Appreciate it, man. It's pretty late over there. Yeah, for cert certain. I actually would have asked if I knew he was going to be awake. I would have had him on. I just figured he it was it'd be a late night for him, so I didn't want to bother him. But 
Um, love AP. Uh, but yeah, so fellow Sinyon is delivered by the Unbound. He'll master killed her friends in our service to the Cripple God. Um, he delivers him to Kalat, which Kalat was the crazy man from Barathal's town. Uh, the rocks which, in the mouth guy, right? Yes, and he's the one whose rum they open, Yeah, which which is kind of funny. Um, and it's weird that Felis and Younger is now going to be the Shaikh reborn. And it's like, remember when Wiccan said they don't ascend, they iterate? Yeah. And now we're yeah. seeing this kind of circle. And I, I, I kind of caught on to that, and I thought that was actually really awesome. Um, and then we, we get more of that. So the, the large amount of this right now is the plague, right? Like we're, we're talking yeah. about the plague. We're trying to figure it out. And this is where like the second book of this book kind of happens. I love um, the plague. Some people say they don't like it. They don't like that. There's really? so cities. Mm -hmm. They don't like how long it takes them to get out of it. And I'm just like, what? This book is awesome. Yeah. Love the plague. Awesome. Oh mm -hmm. yeah. I loved it. Um, and among among those things, I mean, we get more Ganos, and Ganos is one of my favorite characters. I, I just love the entire Peron family; like they're I the like, best. I like I like Perrin also. Mm. Yeah, and he's traveling with the Jag Hut Ganeth, and um, I think the Tr Traders Guild, right? He's with the Traders Guild that was yeah, in Dead House. Yeah, he's with the Tregal. Yeah, and he gives over uh, Adjek Lorne's sword to him. The Traders Guild uh, gentleman right. Uh, right. gives Perrin that, which is kind yeah, of cool. lateral sword. Yeah. Yeah, and then he ends up uh, being picked up by Jujek's company and takes on the name Kindly. And we're hearing more and more about the plague through all this, which yeah. him getting picked up and him being called Kindly, all this stuff. I love that. Yes, I thought Kindly was... Isn't Kindly... Well, Kindly is a character. He's a real he's captain. A real oh, captain. He's going by Kindly. That's and people are telling him, like, oh, man, I heard you did this. And he's like, yeah, yep, sure kindly, was. Kindly is the <laughs> he steals Kindly's identity because yeah. everybody's scared of Kindly. So, yeah. 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 Let me tell you I mean, something. About, about, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Philip. Oh, I was just gonna say, poor Dujek. You know, I mean, yeah. what a way to go. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, oh yeah. man. Yeah. It was yeah. plague, right? It was like, kind of a, it, right? a shock when that happened. Yeah, and he it comes back and Dujek's dead. Page? Yeah. 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 Uh, I will tell you one thing. This and this is one thing that stuck with me, and this is saying something just about Eric Erickson's like kind of characterization. I freak out now. Like anytime I take like a pick, I like to get something out of my teeth. Because the freaking the dude the, the the caster the wizard that uses the fish oh, bone, yeah. fish bone, yeah, to like and like he's got those like gaps in his gums and stuff because mm -hmm. he's always putting the fish bone, <laughs> putting his teeth out. like it freaks me out now when I literally have to do that to get stuff out of my teeth with like an actual like floss pick or something. Like I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna end up like that dude. Like it's just it's literally it's stuck with me for years. It freaks Swallowing me out. a fish bone, yeah. <laughs> It's like sticking a fish phone in your in your like teeth and making them like gap noto boil, putting the gaps in your ah, it freaks me out. Like it freaks me out. So I'm just gonna let I'm just gonna let the food sit there now. I'm not gonna pick it out anymore. I don't want noto boil mouth. Yoda OVGs, thanks for the five spices. One of the many things I love about Malaz uh, is the very real conversations uh, conversation it has for subject matter, sparks about uh, how we live our own lives. Thanks to you for appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Appreciate the five spot. Now, that's 100% why I honestly, Malazan has made me appreciate themes more in other books. Uh, and yes. it's made me a better reader. Uh, Same kind of, here, some Jimmy. people get kind of weird about hearing that, but it's just, it's just how my experience has been. So. No, I feel like I've been loving watching your journey with these books because I feel like my journey is paralleled yours in so many ways. I, I feel so similar to you. No, oh, that's awesome. And there's still like other stuff here, like because me and Alan, we always joke, we're like, we're the explosions guys like we we like talking about the hype moments and i, mean, I, I killed the meal but like it has all of it it has yeah. everything it has so much for and people get mad i see it on the r slash fancy reddit uh, every time someone says i want a book with this someone says malazan for no matter what it is like mm -hmm. They could say, I want uh, mule jokes. And they'd be like, oh, Malaz is perfect for that. Like, it, and people are like, quit recommending Malaz. But it's true. It's just such a big series, covers so many different topics, has so many different characters uh, that there really is something for everyone. Um, now, whether as a whole it works for you or not, it's a whole other conversation. But we also have to understand that not everybody is looking for a yes. multiple thousand page of book, 10 book series. It's like when someone says, uh, can you recommend a good anime to me? Sure watch one piece but it's a thousand episodes that's ridiculous oh no i agree I agree. Everybody. so i think i think some people like right yes there is something for everybody but not everybody's gonna make that commitment like oh yeah. well that's what i'm saying there's a whole different conversation to be had whether the yeah. whole work is for them or not they might yeah, be like, exactly. one aspect just give me a small trilogy I'm, my kingdom for a standalone yeah Can you recommend a standalone please 
<laughs> Not Cage of Souls. Uh, <laughs> I probably am more forgiving of Tchaikovsky than you are. Yeah, that's a, we'll have to have a stream about that as well. Alan, uh, just so everyone knows, Alan uh, said he's reading Cage of Souls by Adrian Shafkowski. I said, oh, I want to read it. And now it's my least favorite book of the year. Oh, <laughs> oh no. It happens. Can't trust him. Look, Florida I've loved everything I've read by Tchaikovsky. Well, wait till you read that one. Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, Fiddler figures out that Lehman's lover is Dunsparrow, which Alan touched on earlier. That's Wh Whiskey Jack's little sister. She was born dead or close to it and already offered up to Hood. They stole her back from the temple and made jokes of it to remove the power that Hood had over her. Fascinating, and I really, really like the fact that they, uh, Erickson touches on the fact that the joking is what removed... That, that connection and the power of hood over her, because so often we do make jokes to kind of remove the power of a tragedy from above us. Um, and I don't know. I like that. It was like a really small piece of the story, but it's something that, that kind of stuck out to me because I'm, I'm one of those people. I laugh in uncomfortable situations and traumatic mm -hmm. events. Uh, I generally will laugh about telling someone a very sad story because what else can I do? Just how, how I, uh, how I handle it. So um, what do you guys think of Scalara? And her baby oh, and her giving I it up. I love Solara. Is that how you say it? Solara, Scalara. I say Solara. What a fantastic character. And how powerful that you get that exploration of somebody who chooses not to have her baby. And mm -hmm. I, I thought she was fantastic and such an insightful character. She is incredibly perceptive. The way she looks at people, the way she looks at gods, like the, all of her insights. I, I just think she's a fantastic character. Yeah. I like yeah. Solara. I yeah. like her how she relates to the other people in the, her party, um, and that she is so perceptive, as you were saying, Joanna. And she's really good at breaking down tension and getting people to, you know, uh, you know, she's somebody who very skillfully. She should be with every party where people are quarreling all the time, and I feel like she would be able to just very skillfully pick people out of that, you know, by, mm -hmm. by, there's a kind of bitterness to her because of her experiences, but there's also this playfulness that she's, she's got life to her. You know, she's, she's, some people just have this vivacity to them. She's got life, you know, in spite of everything she's been through. So I, I really admire her. Oh, that's a great way to describe her. She's very vivacious. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I thought of uh, maybe and Silver Fox and that relationship and mm -hmm. how Silver Fox was draining and like maybe I, I don't know if I'm saying maybe is that how you say it? I don't know. I think it's going to say Mibe. Actually. Well, I just thought of her uh, Mibe as yeah. the other mother in the series that I could I could pull out of my brain. And it's just yeah. like such a different. Uh, oh, I yeah, I, I, I thought that storyline was really interesting. And then like you don't see. <laughs> a mother not choosing the baby in fantasy very often no right? like that is not something you ever see and children seem to be a burden in this world more so because of like at least the babies we see right they seem to be a burden on these people yeah. and probably because the dad's corbelo dom of all people Th it, there's that that's a huge part of it i, I think but she, but it's also part of how she was brought up too right because i think there's a whole part where she talks about that like how um i think this was a common thing in her culture that children were kind of just used to work or used yeah. in that way. Uh, it's interesting, just the commentary throughout the book about gods using people. And uh, of course, like in this case, you know, mothers using children, <laughs> but yeah. she decides not to have anything to do with that. And I just, I, I thought it was a powerful decision. It really kind of surprised me too, because there was a part where young fellas in, I don't know, seemed to come to her and she thought maybe I could practice taking care of you or yeah. something about practicing her skills with her, with young Bellison, but then it didn't quite work out that way. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was definitely a curveball. I did not expect her to mm -hmm. leave the kid behind, but I, I, I liked it. I liked it a ton. Mm -hmm. Um, that we get fellas in younger that is basically helping spread the plague. And she's realizing that she's being taken care of and all this stuff. And she's being mm -hmm. pampered. Uh, and then there's a young spreader boy that's brought in and carries the plague, uh, the pl carries the plague, but is not, is no longer sick, but is a spreader. Uh, and fellas decides to name him Crocus. <laughs> and I'm like, this all just goes in a cycle. It really is. It's just an iteration yeah. of an iteration of an iteration. And then we get the entire scene where Ganos goes into the temple to kill off the plague. Um, which the plague is caused by, I think it's pronounced pull. 
or polio? Polio. Polio. Yeah. Oh, polio. Okay. Dude, and the plan with the dogs is the best. It's the best plan. Would, did this scene not feel like a short story to you? Like I, I know it. he's yeah. a short story author, and that like I understand all that, but like this specifically, I was like, this has just been a phenomenal short story. Mm, uh, yes. Yeah, I I I loved it. I loved the showing up and shadow hunter tricking him with like here's the dogs and just tearing freaking polio. And quick quick Ben saves uh his sister, right, from death. Yeah. Um mm-hmm. right. but by uh being trapped by Shadow Throne with the hounds, only for Absalar to go against Shadow Throne and save Quick Ben. Uh I How thought that was very she. cool. And then we see there is now discontent between Shadow Throne and Cantillion more so. And this is also where Dushek dies, which we talked about. And right. Ganos is now high fist. So he's yeah. the, I forgot master about that. Yeah, yeah, he's the master of the deck of dragons and he's the high fist. Um, yes. that, to be yeah. fair, there's no one left. It's it's Ganos or nobody. I mean, you're, are you going to give it to? Oh, that's right. That's like, right. I do remember There's that no now. one else to be fist. Yeah. yeah. Give that it was to Smiles, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we see Carson and Samar- Samardev. They're going to be going out. They meet Feather Witch with her finger on the necklace uh, from Midnight Ties, which is really cool. And they're going to go off and, and duel uh, Rulad. Um, actually, I'm not positive that was Feather Witch. I took my notes. It might, might have been Feather Witch. Um, I think it was. It was. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then we see a quick scene with Pearl. Pearl, it knows that something's up with the Chain of Dog story. It's not really making sense and that Malik Rella and Corbello are lying. Um, mm-hmm. It's interesting that Malik is such a bag of trash when he serves mail, who I am a huge fan of. I know. Uh, seems like a nice guy and a good God, but that shows that like followers of a good God aren't always uh, studious. I hate, I hate Malik Rell. Malik is oh. the worst. I hate the worst. Oh no! I, I we need Pearl. to read another one of them. Lost yeah, Philip Lily is about to be like, you need to <laughs> read Return of the Crimson Guard. Come on! <laughs> yeah, it's you do need to read novels of the Malazan Empire. <laughs> plus, plus, some months working on the Gistal, which is oh, you know, we can read a book about Malik Rell. Well, I assume. <laughs> I assume he's yeah. You can Malik read all of them. Philip. <laughs> It doesn't mean all of them suck. You'll probably love him by the end of it, Alan. <laughs> you can't just use that tagline for everything. Like you can't do everything with you. You're gonna fall for it every time. <laughs> no, I hate Malik, and I and I don't like Pearl. And you know what else I don't like? I like the Pearl. freaking Malazans. This is what I can't forgive Lacine for. Everything else she's done, and I don't want none of y'all. Don't come forward trying to explain the situation she's in. I don't care. <laughs> she had a choice to make. She had a choice to make, and she chose to sell out the Wiccans to stay in power because Corbel Dom and Malik Rowe were there. She chose to sell out the Wiccans, and that, to me, is the unforgivable thing that she did. She sold the Wiccans out because, yes, like she, she doesn't really have any real authority. She could have taken a stand. What, what are you doing, Lacine, anyway? What are you doing if you're not making a stand? You're standing there being controlled by Malik Rell and freaking Corbelo Dom. And you mm-hmm. sell, I was so mad, because y'all know how much I love the freaking chain of dogs. And to, betray, to say that Coltane was a traitor, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Like, I was, guys, I was incensed. I'm obviously still incensed. <laughs> oh my gosh. Sorry. I, I, I thought you liked the Empire, Alan. I didn't. Uh, Stop. I've like I've forgotten all this until we like got to this part and I'm like, oh that's right. They sell out the Wiccans in this. So yeah. you're, you're the you're whole entire about... ship scene. Yeah, oh, I mean, you're, you're talking about that scene in in, in Milan City when oh, wow. Tavor I skipped a bunch, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. We're we're pretty much here. We're in part four. So I just I just want to mention that with ship scene really quickly though, first, because yeah, it, just, it was so good. And I I I didn't talk about it when I did my video. And I feel like we, I don't know, get skipped over a lot, but that was such a cool scene. Anyway, just want to mention that. Scene. Can you, I've forgotten clearly. The yeah, ship scene where the Malazans and the Salandra and the Malazan Imperial fleet, and right before they get together with the parish, and then the Tistador attack them, and then right. Bottle saves them through the aerosol. And the car says on the other side, and it's just yeah. so cool. About yeah. That. Yeah, that's awesome. It reminds me because Alan and I play a game called Gloomhaven, and it just it hey, I play that too. So, oh, no way! Oh, my goodness. Oh, Do you wanna, that, that's the scene where, where Quick Ben tricks them, right? Tricks them into thinking that he's more powerful yeah. than they are. Yes. 
That yeah. is so cool. I that is that. so cool. Yes, I just I have to mention it because I always forget to talk about it, but it's, I loved that scene so much. And it just, it made me think of Gloomhaven for some reason <laughs> when I was reading it and I just got so lit up. Look at Francois. Look at Francois with this foolishness. Look at this. It was a <laughs> land grab. The Wiccans were just in the way. Francois. Francois, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you? The Wiccans <laughs> were just in the way. Oh, man. Ugh. man. Anyway, game sorry, game I get game worked game. up about that. It makes me so, like, loyalty, having loyalty to the troops, having loyalty to the people that did this. Like, this is why Leomon, no excuse, freaking Lacine here. Like, loyalty is a big thing. Like, I, my wife will tell you. I'm probably, oh, I'm the same way. I'm loyalty probably loyal is like one of way my past things. the point that I should be. So yeah. it just bothers me, especially not loyalty from bottom up, a mm -hmm. loyalty from top down. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like the mm -hmm. and turning Colt like besmirching Coltang's legacy. And the thing is, that's so real. That is so yes. real in how information is manipulated for political gain because politics is poison. How like how you take what really happened, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. There's nothing you can do to stop it. They now it is out there. Everyone thinks that Coltane, that poor like freaking high lord Pormqual was the good guy. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Inexcusable. <laughs> That stupid piece of trash and Coltane betray. Oh my gosh. Oh man. It's so good. So, well, Alan, again, I mean, really if, if you look at history, look yes. at history, our, our history, we have celebrated a lot of people. Look at the guy on the $20 bill, Andrew Jackson. And it's so hard. We celebrate a lot of people in our history who've done some really awful things. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew Jackson committed genocide. I mean, he, he was not a nice guy. No, but he, he he dueled people and couldn't, like, he let people shoot first, and that's so cool. And some dude tried to assassinate him, and the bullets wouldn't come out of the gun because they were afraid of him. And then he beats the guy with a stick, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, that guy's awesome, but also a terrible man. Like, yeah. terrible. Like, I get it. It's... I know, yeah. I know. I mean, this is the way history works. I know. Unfortunately. So what you see there is a reflection of, of our reality, unfortunately. And you said it before about politicians and power and all of that. And Lacine is in a, in a position where she feels she has just bad options, yeah. right? And yeah. she does try to offer Kalam a little something, you know, you know, you could be, you know, if you, if you want to make this to basically throw Tavor under the bus and, and the and, Pearl and too, the Wiccans. Right? Those are not good options. She has a good option. Stand yeah. up against freaking Rel and Dom and stick up for the people who put you there. Like, Kalam has been there the whole time, Lacine. He but, <laughs> but Rel at this point is controlling, uh, if not the entire claw, then large elements of the claw. Well, as we see, that doesn't matter. Like, Kalam yeah. clearly can mow through the entire claw. With you know, help from Absalar, of course. Well, maybe yes. Lacine knew, knows this, right? And Lacine's like, I know what Kalam will pick, and I know that Kalam will clean the house. Yeah. I don't it think anybody matter. counted for Absalar. I don't think anybody counted for Absalar. Absalar see, really no. came into her own this book, yeah. man. And, I love and Absalar. In she's so um, good. Jimmy and Alan, I don't know if you saw it, but there was this wonderful discussion over on AP's channel with Steven Erickson about the specific scene. Wh when about we talk... Real quick, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Uh, people always complain about this in the comments. AP is a critical dragon on YouTube. Yes. We I call him AP that. and people go, who the hell is AP? <laughs> I, I've gotten legitimately probably 20 comments. Like, who's AP? So a critical dragon. Yeah. I'm sorry, continue, Joanna. I'm sorry. Yeah. You can also no, call him Professor Fireballs. Yeah. Yeah. Professor Fireballs and Steven Erickson had a fantastic <laughs> discussion about the scene and about all <laughs> the varying motivations behind each of the characters and how they are all questioning each other. It is fantastic. I cannot recommend that discussion more, but yeah, there is a lot of talk in there about how whisper campaigns happen in the real world. Uh, it is just, it is but, so tragic to think about. What? Mm -hmm. Lacine could still have, could yes. still not have sold out Keltane. I don't she disagree. could have made that choice. <laughs> I'm so mad. Yeah. It's a, it's a great scene, though. I mean, it's just so... Oh, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic It is brilliant. Yeah. I mean, it, it is edge of your seat kind of scene without... And with the threat of violence looming over it all. Yeah. And it's a fantastic decisions, Just like... The tension, you, know, you can cut it with a knife. I mean, yeah. And yeah, I mean, seeing historical... Tavor's weakness. Seeing Tavor 
be yeah. afraid, which we have not seen. She has yeah. been nothing but cold iron the entire time. And watching her, how her fear, like, you know, with, and then watching Tamber get, you know, bite it. Like yeah. that, that's good stuff. Like I would, Ooh. oh, that's I'm going to cool. get emotional all over again. <laughs> oh, that yeah. cool, and then the scene where, um, I can't remember which Malazan it was. And that, now it's driving me crazy. Who protected uh, the Wiccans on, yes. and they bow to him. I just like. Ah, I just like. Oh yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> it I think I have it in my notes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm I'm so vague on details because it's been it a few books now. <laughs> well, there's there's the Widdershins. But it was just. You mean at the docks? Yeah, yeah, at the docks. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Cork Cork is involved in that. I know. And yeah. there's a bunch of heavies, and then of course they get help from their new allies. Uh, uh, after uh, the parish. The, the parish. Yeah. Yeah. yeah parish and the Grey Swords swore fealty to Tavor prior to all this, not the empire. Yeah. And it's very yeah. distinct in that. Mm -hmm. um, and the Destrian seems to recognize quick Ben during all that. And quick Ben gets real nervous. Yes. Which I actually, and I love that. I love how Kalam and quick Ben, because up until then I, throughout the series, I don't know how it's been for you, Jimmy, but I've just been like, what are they thinking? What is their motivation? I've just been like, what? And then when you get to the end of this book, it's like you realize how uncertain they are oh, yeah. <laughs> about what they think. And it's like, oh, they've been uncertain this whole time. Okay. So listen, that is that's life. No one yeah. knows what they're doing. Um, yes. Nobody knows what they're doing. When yeah. I was on the independent wrestling circuit, I always said, oh, I want to get the WWE. I'll, you know, if they'll, they'll have this stuff figured out because just things are just a mess at wrestling shows. Even the, even the, bigger ones it's always a mess i said man when i get to wwe it'll be good right listen i was at tv six times complete shit show they had no idea people were walking up to the car when am i on you're up now oh i gotta go out now you know i mean it's i was like oh it's it's the same all the way up nobody knows what they're doing yeah yep which yeah. is actually comforting in some ways so if you ever feel you're at your job and you say man I don't have my stuff together. I don't know what I'm doing. Guess what? No one around you knows what they're doing. It's nobody, already, not even our leaders. We're all pretending. Nobody. It's because yeah. of the Peter principle. You're promoted to your highest level of incompetence, and that's where you stay, being incompetent. Look it up, the Peter principle. It's oh. true. It's a real thing. I have to look that up, Alan. That's interesting. Yeah. Michael Scott is literally, from the office, is the quintessential example of this. He was a brilliant salesman and was promoted because that's because if you're good at something, they promote you, and eventually you're promoted to a job that you're not good at because it's not the same thing as what you were doing, and so that's where you stay and languish because you've been promoted to your highest level of incompetence. Yeah, and then you get imposter syndrome. <laughs> well, I mean, it's because at that point you are an imposter because you're yeah. incompetent. Um, as it look at all of our world leaders, like they're fools, mm. fools, all of them. They would turn on the Wiccans too. <laughs> I think they would. I think you're right. And oh, we have to mention Fiddler's song. What did you think yeah. about Jimmy? Oh, it's excellent. I mean, it's it's Fiddler's moment. Like yeah. to me, that's like character defining moment, and it sets the scene in Malaz City. Um, I mean, you just you don't get that stuff from a lot a lot of reading, right? Like <sighs> you know, uh, for instance, the Reigns of Castamir, right? Playing at the Red Wedding, it sets that scene. Like when I think of that scene, I think of that song. Mm -hmm. um and fiddler gets to set a stage for an impromptu civil war which i did not see coming when i started reading this book let me tell you uh and it was just awesome <laughs> then you're like if you know fiddler it's too much like back it off it's too much you know it, yeah. oh man Woo. i it's love fiddler. i love you, fiddler. do you know the malazan phrase give answer it comes up all the time and i think that's what fiddler is doing there he's giving answer uh, yeah. by, by playing that dirge um yeah that's it's absolutely beautiful stuff it yeah. is so beautiful. It's just, this whole book is so well done. And I, I guess another thing we can mention there too about that scene um, is the aerosol, Tambor, Tambor's body dying, is that right? And then yes. uh, the aerosol telling, telling, I think it's Lestara to basically go and be mm -hmm. with Tavor and not to tell her <laughs> about Tambor. Which is another, another secret. Another secret, yes. Because the key that Lestara has to keep from Tavor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's like this really weird bond between those two and, and how Lestara sees Tavor. And like that's, again, this has been developing for books and books and books. Um, it, it, I'm very curious to see where that goes. 
Very yeah. excited. I love Lestara, actually. Lestara, I mean, Lestara killing and stabbing Pearl. What did you think of that scene? Good. Oh, Good. I love this. He and, lasted three books too long. Well, also, if you back it up, she also slashed Tanel Barata's neck, who had just been contacted by Gethel from the House of Chains. Right. And that was an inside man with yes. the Empress. Which yeah, is well, Tanel Barata had a bee in his bonnet ever since he got burned. Well, yeah, and now you think about it, though. Now that Tanel Barata's out, I mean, Gethel's going to be pissed. So what's going to happen to Lestara now? Like, I have to assume that that's going to be... A conflict maybe in the yeah future. but you got you have got to cut that cancer out you cannot have mutinous mutinous uh general uh, lieutenants under you as a general you can't like freaking uh ballistics ballistics like witching and moaning that he's done already and yeah. Tene Baralta actively plotting against him. like you can't have that that's gotta go that oh yeah for go. sure um and yeah you're right so pearl before getting got kills kalam right yes uh, which i i immediately said uh i said kalam going uh ham was probably my favorite combat written by erickson it was awesome um and i said kalam nice going with this said kalam going down and pearl not going and checking the body is one of two things either pearl is an idiot or pearl didn't want to kill kalam hmm i thought maybe pearl said oh i got him and i know he had a poison and all this stuff but like when it's Kalam. It's the white parole, isn't it? Like you have to walk over yeah. and be like, okay, pulse is gone. <laughs> right. But I guess this is a slow moving poison. We all know Kalam gets pulled into the acid health. So Right. Um, yeah. The personally, I think the Azath house, like the the dying person being pulled into the Azath house, I think that well has gone to multiple times. And I'm just like, why can't like why can't they just die? Like, why do they have to go to the Azath house? and not die well like, you know what it is what if they just died instead um i don't know I, i'm not a huge fan of that i was happy when kalam died i'm like no he's well, awesome yes and then you know he's i had that say, i actually alan i agree with you i actually was a smidge disappointed when kalam survived not because i want to Kalam yeah. to die because yeah. it's such a bold decision to yeah. make. yeah i mean that's a character a character death thing is always super weird in books like i don't like like i don't like when kalam died i don't like when like if we're going to drag someone into the Zath house, why not Coltane? Like, why can't Coltane get saved? Uh, <laughs> so I don't like when characters die, but also I think it's really cool when characters die. It's like, oh my gosh. Well, so death means something different in this series, I think. And, I, and we've actually begun to even see even more of that here. Because if you remember, Hedge actually shows up with Ganos in the desert whenever he's like raising an army of the dead to go fight this yeah. plague. And then obviously in other reapers again we see some more stuff but whatever uh yeah. i i think so i i kind of get i'm scapegoating it a bit with the fact that i think death is also inspected a lot within in this series um but i do agree with you alan i was kind of disappointed a bit that kalam was saved um, it's an awesome scene regardless oh it's phenomenal and honestly the fact that shadow throne had wraiths drag him in I mean, that adds a whole nother layer of complexity. Yeah, that's freaking it. awesome. Like, it, it's it's a minor quibble at best. And I'm, and I'm fine. It, it now, certainly so. does not does not ruin the awesomeness of that freaking scene. Yes. Eric, that is rude. Oh, my gosh. That's so horrible. <laughs> <laughs> that is so bad. <laughs> it's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> Eric said the reason why Coltane was not put in the Zath house, they couldn't fit the cross through the door. <laughs> Rude. That is a gasoline. Eric. Maybe comment of the year. Guys, on my I just got Yigatan burned with that. Yeah. Like that was <laughs> you might as well just delete your channel. <laughs> at that point. Just call me truth. That's what I am right now after that Ooh. burn. <laughs> Coltane is a wicked. There is no need to save him. He reiterates. Wow. Hmm. Interesting. I kind of like that. Um so yeah, Whiffle shows up as well, who is the one that crafted uh the sword, male uh, and also the one male rescued. Um, I'm trying to just glance over my notes here. We have Helian who kills a claw member. Yeah. <laughs> trying to kill Banishar. And then she finally finds the priest. And of course, she ends wow. up in a <laughs> in a tavern <laughs> that has water running from the Azaz. <laughs> it's so funny, dude. Yes. I love Helian. Like, I will say this. Mm. I thought that was going to go in a totally different direction based on the prologue. And like I said, I kind of want to get back to uh, Carstool or what, whatnot. But what we got from Helian is so funny. Like, I, I don't know. What a great character. Yes. They can they need to say thank you to hellion yeah uh, continuing forward i love hellion yeah hellion mm -hmm. is phenomenal 
Um, and you've read Reaper's Gale, so you know why she's freaking awesome in Reaper's Gale. Yes, I was going to say, I was very excited that she was in Reaper's Gale and, and had scenes, and, and it wasn't just a throwaway, because I would have been very disappointed. Yeah. Um, I just thought, <laughs> ending up in the Azath house with the water running from... <laughs> I, I don't know. That was awesome. She's drunk. Leave her alone. Uh, <laughs> oh, the big battle for the first throne is wild. Um, Akarium oh, unleashed, yeah. and he's going oh, to go after yeah. Troll, and I'm screaming because Troll has become maybe my favorite character in the series. Um, and he melts away Monrak, who melts into the first throne with one eye peeking out. What imagery is that? Yeah. Um, and then Troll holds off Akarium, and at the very last second, quick, Ben is sent, and that is him paying his debt to Shadow Throne and helps, but is almost killed. And the only thing that stops Akarium is the ever elusive Aerosol, uh, yeah. who touches him, and the cotillion seems distraught by how many people are dying. His head is in his hands. I as remember that close. scene. Yeah, that scene, like I, I, I put Akarium, uh, Akarium unleashed is what I put. Um, Oh my goodness. Finally, we see like the power, right? But it, it's to our own detriment. If I mean, if you're a troll fan, which I assume we all are. Mm -hmm. um, but also like the melting into the first throne or like the eye pointing out. It's just like almost Lovecraftian in a way, you know? Like, I, yeah. But the Icar Icarium's unleashing there freaks out even Terlac Veed. And, and mm -hmm. his, of course, he you point him in the wrong direction and he's a dangerous, that's right, Jimmy. It's, a, it's all in getting the right amount of phlegm. I think. Yes, you know? gross. You have to have a certain amount of gingivitis too. That's so gross. <laughs> that's so <laughs> you gotta get the right consistency. You know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, he's, uh, his destructive potential is hinted at there. Hinted at. So, yeah. Wait, did you catch the Warren jump to world war one? I don't know what that means. So no. No, but Seth, please elaborate. And while we elaborate on that, uh, so we see like Karsa's, uh, Karsa's top dog. We have Akarium, uh, which we'll see what happens with those two. Uh, and But then also I keep going back to Crust. I keep thinking about how powerful Crust is. Yes. Uh, you know, just haymakering. Um, uh, so <laughs> Carthron's just as strong. <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> Uh, people are really wondering about this World War One thing, and I, I need to know. I guess I could Google it. Let me see. Uh, World War I. Mean, that's not um, Urko's only feat of amazing strength and prowess. He has some really great moments in other Malazan books, which I Philip. Mentioned. Philip. <laughs> that was a hell of a segue, my friend. Philip. You can't do that. <laughs> no, so, I mean he's a great character. Uh, that's all I'll say. A, a quick Google search of World War One and Malazan. I, uh, I I don't have anything. So uh, Seth, if you can put that in the comments, I guess that'd be great afterwards. Or if you can get it into chat, that'd be even better. But um, I did not know that we were. Um, I did not know that there was a World War One jump. I'm very curious because I love history. So um, someone put race plus finish is pretty OP. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sure. So, I mean, I guess we come to the end of this book, right? And Lestara is now taking the place of Tiamber, who, by the way, we, we didn't really touch on this, but like Tiamber and Tavor seem to be romantically involved. Like, yeah, they they're, they're a couple. Yeah. And that whole scene of, of them trying to survive and going through the crowd, I thought was like really good and really impactful. Um, it's so good. Yeah, that's, and, I mean, part of why Tiamber's death is so, so hard to swallow um you, yeah. you can see here's this very stoic woman tavor who is losing her lover and it's uh pretty heartrending mm. it's really heartrending that's a tough one so yeah and you you get to i mean again we don't get into Tavor's head but you, you got to think about how that affects her you know so yeah. oh yeah, definitely. okay uh a Turuxo, uh i hope i said that right when they're making their way to the first throne, they go through a place with trenches and explosions. Uh -huh. All right. The Warren journey from the Eater fleet to drift to Vale goes to a place that could be, could be. Okay. Okay. That's cool. And I know Erickson probably, you know, being who he is probably, uh, that was probably a nice little Easter egg for him. Um, that was another thing. Uh, and it kind of sets up Reaper's Gale and what we see there, which we'll talk about next time we talk. But, um, the Malazans see the Adur and they say, oh, these people are trying to annihilate everyone with no control, no scruples and no hesitation. This is bad. And, and we know that because even looking, uh, you know, to Karstal City, we say, well, that might have been a good 
case right there of like you know the empire taking over but if when it comes to the adir no yeah there's no like there's no mincing words with the oh. adir like they are going to destroy you uh, at least that's a perception that they have and it sets up the book really nicely um and there's that moment where it's hailing down that green fire do you guys remember that uh and this is like right before Malaz city happens and peron is trying to make a deal um he's trying to contact mail to stop this from happening yeah uh, but he ends up making a deal with hood for it um and her oh, yeah. body gets dumped into the sea on accident and glows green to allow barathal to save Ch uh chow chow yeah know, from drowning yes. and her is a shield anvil for the jade that was coming down from the sky and uh they basically he took their pain and that's what stops uh that green hellfire from dropping down i will be honest i hope i got all those details right i i put in uh, uh parentheses most confusing thing that happened 100, in the book 100 it was so confusing 100%. for me too Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, i'll tell you what's what's beautiful there that relationship between barathol and chower yes so touching yeah. uh, yes and just the the way barathol's this big strong guy and how he is so emotional about Chower, yeah. he, whom he treats like his child. You know, yeah. he's, he's uh, it's so touching uh, what they do with with those two. Uh, beautiful relationship. Yeah, agreed. Barathol was actually really good, and I didn't take a lot of notes on him, but I really enjoyed his character. Um, and and seeing him, you know, at the beginning of the book, and then him showing back up throughout was really cool. Um, and I did really enjoy that relationship a lot. Uh, but Haborg being like the shield anvil and the Jade connections, because I remember the Jade stuff from back, I think it was in Dead House Gates. But I did not totally understand what was going on uh, yeah, <laughs> when I, that happened. Yeah, I had to look it up, Jimmy. I was like, what is happening? It's just sometimes stuff is written in, in a like, there's a lot of abstract stuff going on, and I'm, I just can't picture it. And I yeah. just like, let's just go, let's go to the wiki, shall we? That's the hardest stuff for me in the books. I just feel like when I read something like that, I... I question myself. I'm like, did I yes. did I read that right, or did I dream that? <laughs> well, I get scared that I miss something, and like, I know yeah. I'm gonna miss some stuff, but like, I'm very big on like, I want to have a cohesive story that I understand at the end. Like, I'm okay with being confused, um, mm -hmm. but yeah. if I miss something because I'm being dumb, like that, yeah. that sucks, right? Pratchett does the same stuff, and a lot of a lot of Discworld books end in kind of like this this mad chaotic stuff, and you know, magic and a lot of a lot of very abstract things again happen, and I'm just like. Am I picturing this right? Like, is what I think happening happening? And I, I go look them up. So, yeah. yeah. Um, well, to, to all the doubters, we did it. Uh, we actually did this with uh, under two hours. And I know we glanced over some stuff and we obviously missed some stuff. Yeah. Um, but we talked about good stuff. Yeah, we did. Yeah. That's what counts. That's what counts. Good stuff. Yeah. Melazin continues to challenge me as a reader and as a person. And that's what I love so much about this series. Um, I really value these conversations with you all. And I appreciate you three coming on and, uh, and doing it with me, especially you, Alan, uh, moving around your week night plans with your yes. wife. Tell her, I said, thank you. Um, and, you know, I was telling, I told my wife, I said, I think I've had Philip on. So for so many discussions and, and I, 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 I can't thank you enough. Um, Philip and Joanna for, for your time. Yeah. Um, and I hope we pleasure. Can. It's a pleasure. Yes. I love talking. I love talking to the three of you anytime. Yeah. So, yeah. And yeah. I'm pumped for Reaper's Gale because I feel like Reaper's Gale does. I mean, it obviously has its own thing going on, but a lot of stuff falls over here, especially the Carsa stuff, which we all love. Um, I would love to have you guys back on and also get AP. Um, yeah. Maybe we can do it before the end of the year. That'd be awesome because I've already read Reaper's Gale. I'm um, actually, I'm probably actually the the uh, the least enthused about Reaper's Gale of, of the four of y'all here. It's, I um, I yeah, like uh, Reaper's Gale is is low on my uh, tier list of the mouth. Hmm. It's my least favorite Malazan book, but with that said, oh, I still good. gave it four stars out of five. I mean, I love it. My favorite um, part is the march across freaking leather. Like that oh. is oh, well, the I love the leather. leather. So good. I love the leather. I love that whole. Con I, I love it. The whole. I'm product. excited to talk about Reaper Scale with you all. I'm very I imagine Reaper Scale. Do Joanna we have and to talk about the Patriotists? <laughs> We're gonna talk about Red Mask. No, oh, I forgot Red Mask is in this. Never mind. Red Mask is my favorite. I love. <laughs> I forgot Red Mask is in this. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, it's 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 higher than I thought it was. I keep forgetting Red Mask and the All are in this freaking book. Literally, before you go. 
when I read, I read up to Reaper's Gale and I was partway through Toll the Hounds and then I quit for like 10 years. And then I came back to the series <laughs> and every book I was like, is this the book where I think there's this guy who's like, there's these, they're <laughs> fighting the eater. There's like this battle going on and it just takes place like tangentially to the main storyline. And every book I'm like, did I, did I dream that? <laughs> and then I opened Reaper's Gale and I was like, this is it. I think I said something about So it's life. your favorite oh, book. I have been waiting for the freaking Red Mask thing. Sorry. So yeah. it's your favorite book. You know, it's Bone Hunters really is your favorite book, right? Do what? The Bone Hunters is your favorite book, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. So never mind. I have so, oh, so I'm, I'm excited to talk about this whole series and with you, Jimmy, too, once you're finished because, man. Yeah, you're on really Crippled God. Hot. I You're am. I'm on Crippled God. I'm so excited. But I'm still having, at the same time as I'm starting Crippled God, I'm still having to go back and process my thoughts on Just of Dreams. So uh, it's see, a that, <laughs> That's why I'm hoping to get the Reaper's Gale before the end of the year, because right around January 1, I'm going to start um, Toll the Hounds. And yeah. I, I just want to be caught up, ready to go. And I'll be honest, like these chats really help me process stuff. And mm -hmm. I always learn something. I messed up something somewhere. And Blood it's tornadoes. I mean, it's a oh, good opportunity. Yeah. To, and it's uh, hard too when you go on to the next book because it'll yeah. blur together with a previous one. Oh, Reaper's yeah. Gale was coming in my mind half like. Yeah. That little child prophecy from the aerosol Re at the beginning. Reaper's Gale introduces Clip. That's yes. Right. Oh, yes. That's and right. Clip is a. Yeah. Clip is the yo yo <laughs> we'll champion of Lether, like 10 time yo yo champion. <laughs> What, what were you saying about him, Hot Topic? Yes, he shops at Hot Topic as a wallet chain that connects his yo-yo to his bus pass. He's got like spiked like wristlets <laughs> and he wears his hair like this and listens to My Chemical Romance in the oh, dark. Sounds like half the like wrestlers the I know. I Clip does. Clip, is, <laughs> Clip, does anyone like Clip? We'll, fi we'll find out on the Reaper's Gill Street. Okay. We'll I, find out. I've literally never met anybody that likes Clip. If, any, if it's going to be anybody, it's going to be Philip. Yeah, there's probably, is there a novel in the Milwaukee? <laughs> Philip, so help me if you say that. <laughs> It'll make actually, trilogy. Out, if you read novels of the, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> if there is a clip book. Oh I don't God. like clip either. I'm sorry. I don't like <laughs> Guys, if Philip doesn't like him, y'all know he sucks. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right, everyone. It's been wonderful. Uh, Philip, Joanna, Alan, thank you guys all thank so you. much. Thank you for I appreciate you. Me, uh, and, and then our, <laughs> our, you know, our extra guest is always the chat. So chat, thank you for being here. Uh, you were lively, informative, Yay. and I appreciate all of you. I love this fandom. I really do. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's been good to have discussions and on, honestly make, make a lot of new connections. So, um, we will be back with Reaper's Gale here in a few weeks, I hope. Uh, and until I see you next time, make sure you're good, you're safe. And remember to always... Keep turning the page. I'd kill the mule.